This is Cybert signing into Red Alert 3 for the 2022 Christmas Tournament Double Elimination Event. There were three tournaments to uh, kick off the end of the year. The holidays that Game Replays put on, and they were a double elimination and two turbo rounds of tournaments. We'll get into that in just a moment. On the left side, playing random, drawing Empire. This is DDF. And on the right side of Infinity Isle for game one of this best of three, this is Dutch Army. Allies versus Empire. But as I said, Dutch Army didn't know that when the game started. DDF has opted to play random, and as a result, he gets game one, Empire, he got the drop on Dutch Army. So Dutch Army, maybe he would have opened this up a little bit differently, but honestly, I think he chose the right opener. Now let's get into some other of the details. This is a best of three. This is effectively the upper bracket semifinals of the Christmas tournament double elimination. Huge, huge thanks to Rage of Heat for organizing and putting on this event. He donated a chunk of the $260 prize pool and someone else donated the other part of that. But that prize pool is actually spread out between three events. So Rage of Heat, he donates some money and then he spreads it out between a ton of events. So lots of players have an opportunity to get a little bit of a Christmas gift here courtesy of Rage of Heat and the other sponsor. And this is actually gonna be distributed between eight different winners, both in this tournament and in the turbo tournaments, as well as four random draws. So in total, there are 12 prizes between these three events. And that's always cool to see. Someone who shows up who doesn't win a single game could still win a random draw prize. And Dutch Army is going to be going for the kill on the power plant. He can do big, big damage, and then he could just run away and try and skate away to another part of the map. DDF goes for a very quick tier two on his mecha bay, gets out a tsunami tank, and will chase away that Riptide. First Apollo is out, and was it actually two Apollos? Wow, he goes two Apollos, no Vindicators. He thought it was going to be Tangus. Dutch Army was predicting Tangus. The result was an immediate Tier 2 and a Tsunami tank, which kind of makes the Apollos useless. They're flying around, they shot down a Burst Drone, and now Dutch Army, he's wasted that time, he's wasted that money on Apollos when he needs Vindicators. Vindicators, which could be doing literally anything else, bombing the Oil Dark, bombing this Harvester, trying to kill a Tsunami Tank, killing off Imperial Warriors, but he's got two Apollos instead. And when you don't get the read on your opponent, sometimes that kind of stuff can happen. The Tsunami Tank will chase down this Riptide. I don't think he'll get the kill. The Riptide is going to try and escape out to the water. And keep in mind, there's a bunch of Peacekeepers inside of that Riptide as well. So that is a very expensive Riptide with all of those air units inside of it. Strikers are going to get a couple of shots off here. Tangus will be safe for now. Or the one Tangu will be safe for now. Dutch Army going to be kicking himself with how this game has started out. He didn't get the kill on the power plant like he wanted, and that power plant damage is the only real disruption to DDF that Dutch Army has had. Now, this is a double elimination, but this is a best of three. So this whole tournament will wrap up relatively quickly. It's pretty short rounds, and then the turbo tournaments are even more truncated. They are very short rounds in those turbo tournaments. And I believe they played both turbo tournaments in one day. So the way that they've done this in the past, and I think it's the same here, is the double elimination will be, say, for example, on a Saturday, and then the turbo tournaments will be the next day on Sunday, and they'll be staggered throughout the day. So depending on where you live, your time zone, and how much, how long you want to be playing in the tournament, uh, you might find that the turbo tournament suits your needs a little bit better, or you might play in all three. Take your chances in every case, and the Tangus are going to find the Riptide, find the Peacekeepers, and that's going to be a complete shutdown. They will get some damage onto one of the Tangus, but not enough to really write home about Dutch Army gets a kill on basically nothing loses another riptide maybe even the javelin soldier that was inside of it as well so this is a terrible opening for dutch army but 
Maybe he can play defensive, use those cryocopters, and try and turn this into a win. His fourth refinery could be added on, and he's going to need it if this third refinery falls to the Yari mini subs. But DDF looking good. This guy has been playing phenomenally for the last couple of months, and he's here starting out in a really strong fashion here on Infinity Isle. Also, that multi gunner, that uh, oil derrick. No multi-gunner turret out here. But that oil derrick did not get taken down. It almost got eliminated, but Dutch Army went to attack some other stuff. He went to use his Vindicators to bomb out something else instead. And now these Yari mini-subs, one of which which got shrunk down, have been harassing this ore refinery, causing some problems. And now the Harvester is gone, and the Yari mini-subs take down the refinery as well, right as Dutch Army places his refinery on the high ground. DDF, so careful with every single unit. I think almost the only thing he has lost, I mean, maybe other than a couple of Imperial Warriors, are those Yari mini-subs. Finally, the Oil Derrick does go down. It gets eliminated, and Dutch Army, who is drawing a zero on his bank account, is going to have to figure out something for this late game. Does he have enough cash to go Tier 3? His income isn't fantastic, and unless he gets a big kill on the Army of DDF, he will never find the security and the safety to go Tier 3. Guardian Tank does go down. The walls are a nice way to buy some time, but when the choppers just fly right over top, and actually this oil derrick is exposed as well, but when the choppers fly right over top, this might actually be the moment. It's kind of difficult for uh, Dutch Army to do anything about it. Way too many Tangus, point defense drones as well, so that he can deal with these Apollos. Maybe not over top of the IFBs, at least one Tangu will go down here. Second Tangu might be eliminated. There is a Javelin or a Multigunner turret or something inside of that build radius, and he will be able to take out a couple more Tangus on exit. Cryocopter has been rebuilt. Getting to Tier 3 would be amazing so that Athena Cannons could become a part of the equation. But DDF doesn't seem to want that to happen. Fourth refinery up and running for DDF, and currently it has not been harassed. Dutch Army has been so much playing on his own side of the map, trying to keep himself above water and stop from drowning. Naval Yard is reproducing Yari mini subs to make sure that there is no naval expansion for Dutch Army. Still no Tier 3 started for Dutch Army. Again, I don't know when he would actually feel secure enough to go for it, but it feels like he's going to need something to be able to take this game. He has built up a decent number of Guardian tanks and IFVs split between a couple of fronts. He's got IFVs on the high ground, Guardians as well, and then on the low ground also. Point Defense drones will be reapplied to this Tangu VX army, and the Tier 3 is potentially on the way here for our Empire player. He cancels something, and I think he's going to start up Tier 3 next. DDF has the cash in the bank. More than four grand, basically just sitting there, hanging out in his bank account. Lots of Apollos are here. The Tangu's trying to close the distance. The Cryocopter is exposed. This Cryocopter can go down, and these Apollos going to escape. A couple of them with their lives, but the Cryocopters and those other expensive units all getting eliminated. Goodbye to Dutch Army's air advantage. It's going to be the Shogun battleship out on the water. Tier 3 applied to that naval yard. Not so much the Mecha Bay, but that is okay. Uh-oh. Uh Barracks goes Tier 2 as well. What could DDF have planned for that? The spread of Yari mini subs, tsunami tanks, and other units, sea wings emerging from that naval yard to make sure that the cryocopters don't have a free win out here on the water. Guardian tanks are maybe going to be getting split up by these walls. We'll see. As uh, the Guardian tank, the walls were a powerful part of last year's Christmas tournament. An extremely active participant in the battle in a way that we don't normally see. Cryocopter going to try and exit out to the north side of the map. Tangus are responding. They're going to be able to catch the Cryocopter if they want. They can go for the dive on top of these Apollos. They can look for the kill, and they will find one Apollo. But for now, the Cryocopter escapes. It flies right into the waiting arms of those sea wings. Goodbye, Cryocopter. The second one knocked down. The Vindicator's wings are clipped, and 
Dutch Army finds no value, finds no wins here on Infinity Isle. Total control from DDF and not even a Shogun battleship has yet graced this battlefield and suddenly Dutch Army realizes how far behind he is. He still doesn't have that tier three. He was not able to get it out. DDF still feeling good as his mecha bay, his barracks, and his naval yard are all tier three. He's got one and a half K in the bank and Eureka on the battlefield. Apollos don't fly too close to the middle of the map. Eureka might find a couple of you to clip your wings and take you down. No tier three. This is becoming a very difficult situation for Dutch Army. The closest thing to a good thing that you could say for Dutch Army is that DDF hasn't taken a fifth refinery, which uh, is not much of anything to say at all. And Dutch Army is uh, gonna, he's gonna need something, I don't even know what, but he's gonna need something truly amazing in the next couple of minutes of this game. Uh, an engineer cap of the MCV would be a start, but I don't know. The the Mecha Bay is already tier three. The Barracks is already tier three. There's a Naval Yard that's tier three. Like, what do you even do in this situation against everything that DDF has? And I mean, DDF, he's, he can, you know, happily play random for the rest of this event. Maybe next time he'll draw a different faction and Dutch Army will be having a better chance in game number two. But game number three just looks so perfect from DDF. So well crafted and so well played. Shogun Battleships shelling this refinery. It's soon going to be a two refinery game for Dutch Army. He had that oil derrick when his opponent didn't for a long time, but... That is, again, the closest thing to an advantage that you could find for Dutch Army. Cryocopter takes a little bit of damage, will push back, and uh, will get pushed back by those sea wings, and it just sort of feels like we're waiting for the end as DDF takes the win, and Dutch Army will have to find his strength in game number two. And we all hope that that strength is industrial for the man from the Netherlands. He's close to getting dropped to that lower bracket here in the semifinals of the upper bracket. This is Dutch Army. And in the South Plain as the Yellow Plain Empire once again, this is DDF. Plays random, gets Empire twice in a row. He's going to be pretty happy about that, but the dogs will spot it pretty early. So Dutch Army, he isn't committing huge, huge to the infantry. He didn't go double barracks, but he did go single barracks. He will grab one of the oil derricks, and that is as good of an opening as he could ask for. Doesn't go airfield immediately. Instead, well, actually, he could follow up with the airfield after that first refinery, but... I think it's going to be turning out a little bit more normal, and this is D this is Dutch Army's chance to make this best of three into a three-game series. Otherwise, he's going to have to take his chances in the lower bracket. By the way, uh, upper bracket semifinals in the lower bracket, God of War, Waff the Wolf, and Andre have already descended to the lower bracket in the first round of this tournament. So those guys are going to be potentially waiting for whoever loses this series. DDF and Dutch Army are both really strong players, but Andre could take any of them down. Waff the Wolf, probably not as much. He is still pretty rusty. As far as I know, he didn't do a lot of uh, prep for this tournament. I don't, he, I, I guess maybe I don't know, but I don't think he did a lot of prep for this tournament. I think he did get Demon in round one of the tournament, so that's kind of an unlucky draw as far as the seeding works. But unless Waff the Wolf played a bunch of practice and got back to his former self, Waff the Wolf is, like, dangerous, but not at the same level of the guys who are playing actively in the competitive scene. Meanwhile, God of War, who we see put out good performances in team games, hasn't been there in the 1v1s nearly as much. Although God of War also from the Netherlands, so both Dutch Army and God of War are Dutch players 
A couple of other people from Red Alert 3 are also Dutch. Not that that has anything to do with anything. But we do have a refinery block coming in here. Naval Yard will be deployed. It is going to be into the Riptides and a Tier 2 Mecha Bay once again, right from the beginning for DDF and right into double Striker VX also. So he is not worried about a Cryo Rush, but he does think it is going to be Airfield and maybe some Vindicators, maybe some Apollos, and that's why he gets the Strikers right away. He doesn't go for the Tangus. He isn't trying to win that fight exactly. He wants the Strikers first, that Tier 2, and then, of course, he can go into Tsunamis as well. Great delay on the third refinery. It does mean that DDF can keep an eye on exactly what Dutch Army is doing over there. He's got that little bit of vision from the walls, and he can keep an eye on what the timing of Dutch Army's refinery is. He doesn't have to worry too much about, you know, uh, keep sending scouts, running Imperial Warriors or Burst Drones or whatever. He doesn't have to do anything like that. He's got the walls to see exactly when that third refinery is potentially coming up. Vindicators will cross the map. Apollos are here as well. Dutch Army is going to get a good look on, at the other side of the map. Cleans up a Tangu. Might be able to escape as the middle of the map. The Tangus from DDF are hunting the forces of Dutch Army. And Dutch Army has at least got himself a couple of extra ticks from that oil derrick because of this air play that he just pulled off. But the oil derrick will go down. DDF unable to catch Dutch Army in the middle of the map. And as a result, he will just return to his previously scheduled killing of that oil derrick. Refinery probably starting up right here for Dutch Army. He's going to be adding on that third, and DDF has the comfort of knowing, okay, the other guy's third refinery isn't going to be super fast. I got the block on that, and now at some point, I do expect DDF to try and take a third. Maybe he MCV sells from this point, but I assume not. But he also hasn't started a third, but, you know, we shall see. It is a Tengu Striker game here for DDF. Or Refinery comes up. Dutch Army replacing that Oil Derrick that he lost with an Ore Refinery. So he will be back ahead in the economy game as he was a little bit earlier. Strikers maneuvering not to the north side of the map. Instead to the middle of the map. They're just, they're just hanging out as Dutch Army preps himself for the late stages of this game. Tier 2 has been added on for our allied player. Cryocopters, I assume, will be mixed in, but for now, he's going for the double Riptide. He's got jabs inside, might have a couple of Peacekeepers also, but it's going to be the jabs going for the big punch of those air units. If they could only get their rockets off, then they could actually land some damage. And finally, the third refinery from DDF. It is on the way. It is going to be here. It'll just... It'll just take a minute to arrive. Apollo does land. Oh, the transform being a little bit janky on those Mecha Tangus. Will be able to uh, save one of them for the moment. Nice bomb splitting by Dutch Army. Really solid there. And one Apollo will pay the ultimate price for that. And the Riptides load back up. First Cryocopter is out. The dance back and forth from these players has mostly been saber rattling and little points of damage here or there. But Dutch Army is worried about this expansion. Preemptive double multi-gunner turret will find the defense to be pretty strong. No one has gone for the garage yet. We did see actually a dojo core get produced at some point by DDF. Looks like he hasn't actually gone for the garage. So he would probably love to have that at this moment. Cryocopter comes in, goes for the shrink. Javelins get shredded, and the building does get taken by DDF. So this is going to be a bit of a wash in the middle of the map. The Strikers will be able to transform now that the last Javelin Soldier has gone down, and the Strikers survive. The point defense drones making sure of that as a fourth refinery is going to be coming online momentarily for DDF. Faster to the fourth, and he still has his oil derrick as well. DDF looking good in game number two. He wants to head on to the winner's bracket final. He wants to go on to that best of five and have a shot at the clean run into the grand finals. 
He will get a one point advantage in the grand finals if he is able to conquer the upper bracket. Whoever goes into the grand finals plays that final best of seven and they only need to win three games to do it. Which I didn't realize, coming from more of the RTS, you know, StarCraft II, Command & Conquer, every time we do a double elimination, it almost always has some kind of a bracket reset mechanic. Either you do a double series where you extend out the first series if the upper bracket winner loses in the grand final, or you do a point advantage. And then you go to other video games where... They maybe don't do that. League of Legends is the one that's that comes to mind where it's like, oh, this best of five, and if you win in the upper bracket, the only security is that you don't have to play in the lower bracket. You don't actually get any advantage from that. So the guy from the lower bracket who got two chances can then just come back and, like, knock you out. But I also understand, you know, it's a different game. They have a different uh, set of rules that govern how long matches end up taking. So I understand there are some logistics for that. But, whoa, where did that... That roof just truly exploded out. Dolphin comes in, going to be able to joke and jive, dodge around these two units, wasting so much time of this Harvester. Tangus will be getting cleaned up a little bit here. They do try and find the Apollos, but Dutch Army too careful with the Apollos in the sky and the Javelin soldiers on the ground. Those Tangus cannot have a free win to knock down those air units. War Factory on the left, three refineries, and a tight-buttoned base is what Dutch Army is going for. But the four refineries plus the oil derrick of DDF can't go on for much longer. Dutch Army does now realize this. Tier 3, the Shogun Battleship, could be a big problem for Dutch Army if DDF pulls off something similar to what he did in that last game. Oil Derrick does at least go down. Dutch Army does do a little bit of damage to DDF. And he's been able to find a couple of kills here and there, mostly on the Tangus. I feel like pretty much all of his kills have been on Tangus. Tank Buster is getting added on. DDF. He's going to be happy to take this ground fight with everything that he's got. The Assault Destroyer can ca still cause problems. But no big presence of Peacekeepers mean that those Tank Busters are going to have to be crushed. There is basically nothing else in this army that is good at killing Tank Busters. So we'll see how the crushes come through. One of those things where if the Tank Busters are clutch, they can shred this army so much faster. And if the Tank Busters just get annihilated, well then the, the Allied army might just crush and roll over this Empire army. Especially with this garage now being captured for Dutch army. DDF has really extended this game out. Not a lot of harassment featured from the sheer number of Tangus that he has. Uh, Imperial Warriors, that was kind of a weird move. They just ran right for those jabs, and the result was one, two jabs end up going down. That heroic Imperial Warrior gets so many kills, actually. The first part of that was perfect from Dutch Army, and the second part was a colossal failure as these Tangus get frozen in the main base and knock down a couple of power plants, but not much more than that. No harvesters going down. Dutch army just crushed the entire army of DDF. He found the kills in the north, in the south, and now the main base is wide open. A couple of tsunami tanks are here as soon as the army of Dutch Army gets here. That MCV is going to be short for this world. It is not going to be around for very long. And this, uh, actually, if a cryocopter comes through, it'll be even worse for Dutch Army. Going for the crush, it is going to be one tsunami going down, but the Vindicators clean up the other tsunami tanks, and the Assault Destroyer goes down, but the attack is being kept alive. Peacekeepers will shred those tank busters, and the MCV has lost so much of its health, trying to batter down these units, trying to go for the crush, but it will not happen, and the tank busters are the last hope of DDF. One tsunami tank and a couple of tank busters are all he has. Peacekeepers close the distance, tanks go for the crush, and Dutch Army wins the ground war, even though he lost in other places. He crushes the Tangus as they try to go for the harassment, and he wins the fight on the ground. The first part of the game not going Dutch Army's way, but this big army push, he found the damage, and that slow buildup of vehicles 
from Dutch Army was a lot was what allowed him to come back in this game. DDF, no harassment and no way to oh my gosh he's gonna get almost everything on the ground he gets only two guardian tanks missing but three more guardian tanks roll up to this fight ddf is getting knocked around here in game number two and dutch army wants to make it one to one heading into game three heading into the ace match another cryo shot will fire off fully heroic guardian tanks Three of them are here as the Tsunamis get point defense drones. They get Emperor's Rage as well. This is the best shot that DDF is going to have at turning this fight around. Peacekeepers on the front line absorbing shots, absorbing random fire from these Tsunamis, and they just get popped and destroyed. DDF coming through in game one with a strong win, but Dutch Army coming through with the revenge in game two. Dutch Army biding his time until he had that big ground army and then DDF thought that that was the moment to try and split the map and it did not work. That cryo shot doing huge work in the north and Dutch army getting the win on industrial strike. Which takes us to hard lesson for game three in the north playing as the red allies feeling much better after that game number two he finally found his footing and it was actually on the ground not in the sky plain red this is dutch army meanwhile the south side of the map once again plain random and would you believe it drawing empire three games in a row this is DDF. Both of these players tied up one to one. And every time we have someone playing random, there's always people who are like, well, wait, how random is it? I mean, it's crazy that he got Empire three games in a row. And we did some very minor looking into it. And it does seem like Red Alert 3 hits these weird streaks where you will get uh, very consistent factions randomly. And so if you have a relatively small sample set of data, the randomness can actually look very not random. But if you go, if you expand out to like 100 games, it goes down to and it becomes very, very close to 33, 33, 33. And so, yeah, you can end up in these situations where you get one or two factions, really high percentages, especially in like, say, 10 games in a row. Uh, but as you expand out to more and more data, whatever it is about the RNG that picks your faction, it does eventually end up evening out. I know in Kane's Wrath, it's actually dictated something to do with your system clock. So if you go in and like you switch your time, there's something about that where you can kind of manipulate what your RNG is, which I guess means that both players' computer will roll the dice and in theory, you could like change your system clocks to always end up with uh, whatever. I don't know how it works in Red Alert 3 though. I know that when I did it, it was it ended up being random, but it did take like, you know, 60 or 100 games worth of data to see that pattern emerge. All that to say, we have Empire three games in a row for DDF. He's going to be feeling good after game number one. Not so great after game number two, but Hard Lesson is a little bit of a weird map. You do have these expansions that kind of point you towards the middle of the map, and then you've got this double expand in the corner situation that we've seen on a couple of other maps. Big Tangu Cloud coming out for kind of the first time. It's going to be a tier one mecha bay just pumping Tangu after Tangu after Tangu for DDF. This is an adjustment to his playstyle. He's feeling like, all right, that tier two mecha bay, it worked really well on Infinity Isle. It didn't work as well on Industrial Strength, and I think the solution is more Tangus. And if I'm honest, that's pretty much always the solution for an Empire player is more and more and more Tangus. I mean, in theory, if you build an infinite number of Tangus, you will win most games or you'll just crash the Red Alert 3 client. Apollo's moving in. Tangu's transform. They will not find any kills there. And the Riptides and the Vindicator's going to be rolling on up. 
that uh, Infinity and Imperial Warrior are going to be going for a little bit of harassment. One Tangu goes down, does a little bit of splash damage there. Riptides are going to be on the run. Vindicator comes through, just one Vindicator, three Apollos will be the choice for Dutch Army. And Dutch Army now trying to pick off a couple of Imperial Warriors here or there. DDF has been playing these engagements out really well for the most part. But every opportunity for a misstep gives Dutch Army that chance to try and outplay DDF. DDF feels like the player with the better history, and indeed, in terms of tournament performance, DDF has the better record. In relative terms, Dutch Army is the up-and-comer by comparison. But, obviously, Dutch Army, his rise to being a top player is a little bit old now. It's not like it just happened yesterday. It's not like it happened last week. He has been a top contender for a little while. And he's been taking games off of Demon. He's been taking games off of similar level players, sometimes even beating them in series. So DDF, he's the historically better player of the two. But Dutch Army is no slouch either. Apollo's coming back to the main, and this is now five Apollos on the front line looking to shut down that big Tangu cloud. And the Apollos do fly directly over the Imperial Warriors. Only one Tangu doesn't transform. For whatever reason, that guy did not get the memo. Another Tangu will go down. Riptides are going to try and run for the hills. If they could get down to the water, they would be able to fight a little bit better. And one Riptide will sacrifice itself so that the Tangus can't get the other Riptide. Second airfield is near the natural expansion, and this dumb Imperial Warrior in the north just keeps on firing away at that oil derrick. It's always so distracting, way up in the very northern edge of the map. Tangu's not going for the transform. Of course, that would be a bit of a death sentence with six Apollos on Overwatch. And now the Apollos getting targeted down. One of them goes very low in health as that striker moves forward and gets a couple of shots off. Airfield coming up. No Naval Yard rebuild yet. I feel like we might be on the verge of a Naval Yard being added on, but maybe he just goes War Factory instead. Lots of walls for Dutch Army. He's hoping that he can use those walls to buy him some time as the army of DDF moves across the map. DDF, he hasn't gone for the big four or five refinery numbers. He's just sticking with the three. He's got the oil derrick, and he's hoping that this tier two Tangu VX army can be a classic win for him on hard lesson. Apollo's moving in. Guardian tank as well. Vindicator goes for the kill, and he will accidentally sacrifice his own Harvester there in the fight to kill off that Tangu. Multi-gunner turret gets deployed. Big damage onto that Striker. Fortunately, the Laser Painter did expire, and so that Striker will survive the first bout with this army. Into the building they go. These units going to try and find safety from the Guardian. And these Apollos are here. There's a lot of Tangus and the Strikers on the ground. So in theory, this could go the way of DDF. But he's now going to transform. He's going to go for the Guardian tank. Most of the other forces on the ground have been cleaned up for DDF. And the Guardian tank is going to split away. Most of that fight happening in the air. Just a touch on the ground. As DDF and Dutch Army awkwardly dodge and weave around and past each other and end up doing very little. Both very cautiously playing out this next stage of the game. It is game three in a best of three. Neither one of them has an inch to give. They both are in the in with the fear of falling to the lower bracket. Naval Yard and a refinery into the corner of the map. DDF is probably right in that he needs a bigger economic advantage. An oil derrick versus no oil derrick is not much of an advantage. Sure, it adds up over time, and the extra money is always nice. But a whole extra refinery is a lot more. Clipping the wings of two Vindicators is even more. The Apollos get split up. There's no jabs, no IFVs on the ground, and one Vindicator goes down. But the Tangus are a little bit too slow on the uptake to find the kill on the second Vindicator. They will scout the entire base of Dutch Army. They will scout almost the entire map as the Naval Yard comes online in the south. 
Tangus on Overwatch, fly over, and now the barracks transition has happened. DDF adding on Imperial Warriors, Tank Busters, anything he can to try and beef up his army and make this next fight go in his favor a little bit more strongly. Dutch Army kind of had the better ground army for a little while there. He has added on IFBs, which will help his Apollos in these fights. And also Dutch Army is going to probably need to go Tier 3 and get Athena Cannons at some point, but he instead adds on a Barracks. We haven't seen a lot of Cryocopters, just kind of realizing that that's kind of a key piece of the puzzle that is missing for this Allied player. We saw a couple of them in the previous two games, but not a ton of Cryocopters. DDF has been doing a pretty good job of shutting those down as well. So not only has Dutch Army not been building a lot of Cryocopters, but DDF has been doing a pretty good job of making sure that they aren't effective. And the Tangu trying to deny the scout of this Apollo. And the Apollo will probably get shut down, get cornered and caught. But, oh no, the Tangu's let it escape. It doesn't really matter. Dutch Army got all of the intel that he wanted and killing that one Apollo isn't some big advantage. The double refinery has been revealed. Dutch Army now realizes how far behind he is and that he is going to need to pull off a very big win with his ground army in the next fight. Tier 3 still has not started for Dutch Army, so if it comes down to artillery wars, Dutch Army, well, he may not be at much of a disadvantage purely because the Tier 3 hasn't started on the other side as well. Yari Mini said sub comes out. Chronosphere gets added on. Low power for just a moment until that power plant finishes up. And we'll see if this Chronosphere is actually able to make the difference. We see some games, like uh, those Vindy game, Vindy's games from long, long ago. Sometimes that Chronosphere is unbelievably effective. It looks so incredibly cost-effective. And then other players use it, or the situation isn't quite right, and they just can't find the damage with it. IFB is going to be leading the charge. Apollo's coming in. There's the big transform. This will be a wash of basically every single Peacekeeper. Going to allow those Tank Busters to do a little bit more damage. There are still a couple of Peacekeepers mixed in with this army. They could jump inside of those IFBs as well, because these Tank Busters will absolutely shred the front line of Dutch Army. He's going to have to be careful, but there's two minutes, 10 seconds on the clock, so DDF knows that there is some timer to beat. Tangu moves forward, two Tangus getting frozen. Uh, Tank Buster as well gets eliminated, but that's the cryo shot off the board now as the Tank Busters take down one Guardian Tank. No, they go for the IFB instead, and the Peacekeepers close the distance, but it's going to be the Tangus clearing out those Peacekeepers in the sky the apollos hoping for a target to gun down but they just don't have anything to shoot at ddf looking for a better angle on the engagement there's the big transform Tr uh, the strikers going down one by one the apollos gonna be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the tangus but the strikers are the thing that will be doing the damage and the strikers are what survives the war factory down to half health down below half health as the next striker shows up the jabs will be the threat that needs to be dealt with and the tangus go for the transform the last ifb potentially to pop out of that but no, another Apollo steps onto the field. This Apollo is currently unmatched. One striker down, another striker doesn't go down, barely. He gets the transform and Dutch Army's ground army disappears, but he keeps his hope alive. An MCV down at half health, a War Factory down at half health. Neither building has been eliminated, both have survived at least for now. Another IFV could be brought out onto the field there. Finally, the Strikers get their kill. The Tangu goes for the transform, but the, the Apollo goes golden. Every single Striker going down. Every single wing gets clipped, but no. The last hit comes in, and it'll be the Striker that wins the ground war. Dutch Army has bought himself enough time. There's no escape for that Striker, a fully heroic Striker taking so little damage from that IFB. As soon as he transforms, he might get a couple of shots off, but the health bar is too low, too slow now. And the last couple of rockets impact. Takes the power plant down to half health, and behind all of that, the Chronosphere is ready to go. 
but so have the five har five refineries turned into now seven of DDF. There are 10 refineries on this map and Dutch Army controls three of them. DDF behind this goes for a double expand. This was not the last play. This was only another step in the game plan and now DDF has his own timer. Dutch Army thinks that this is the keystone in the bottom right hand corner, that that's where it hinges on, but it's not. The bottom right hand corner almost doesn't matter. It's not that it doesn't matter, it's just not that big of a deal. And the timer of the Chronosphere is not the end of the game, but these seven refineries will end the game for Dutch Army. So much cash is now at the disposal of DDF. He almost literally can't even spend it all. Dutch Army sitting at 1.4 in the bank. He was rebuilding his MCV. He's got that back online now. He can get back up to tier two eventually, but that's why he's been floating a little bit of cash because he lost his MCV. DDF though, he just has a ton of income, so much income that he's gone for two war factories and that IFB goes heroic. DDF can pay for this victory in blood and oil. That is all he needs is pure spam of units. It almost doesn't even matter what he builds because whatever he builds will drown out Dutch army. This is going to be a death of the Dutchman. There is almost literally nothing he can do to stop this because he has yet to stop the seven refineries of his opponent. The Peacekeeper is going out onto the field. I don't know if he realizes this. He may have maybe gotten Scout up on the north at some point, but it almost really doesn't matter. Power Plant's going to be taking, getting taken down, and it eventually will be a low power mode situation for Dutch Army. 8K in the bank for DDF. His macro isn't even particularly good in this moment. He just needs to queue up, you know, 99, 99, 99, just you know, 99 of everything, just about, and just absolutely go for it. He also hasn't ranked up. He could have gone multi-MCV if he wanted. He could have, which, you know, is kind of pointless for Empire, but just for the meme of it, he could have gone multi-MCV. He could have gone tier three on everything. He could have littered the map with turrets, but he is sitting now on 8.4K in the bank. Not quite back up to tier two. No cryocopters. Dutch Army, I think he has gotten an idea that the top left-hand corner of the map is also taken. Oil Derrick plus seven refineries, and the original ones aren't even re depleted yet. Dutch Army now down to two refineries. He's got his Chronosphere. He's got his Cryo Shot, whatever he's up to. Oh, actually, that does force the sell-off of a refinery. Uh, DDF can build another refinery take its place and still have four grand in the bank so I don't think he's too too worried about that and four grand in the bank plus a lot of refineries and a giant army as DDF descends upon the base of Dutch army chronosphere will save the MCV for now but where can he even send it that will be safe on this map there's nowhere that's safe there's nothing that you can do against all that power DDF will take the 2-1 and advance into the winner's bracket final, and that will send us down to the other upper bracket semifinal. And that takes us to industrial strength in the north, playing as the Red Allies. This is Pika. He's going airfield first. He is opening up with a lot of walls as well. Meanwhile, in the south, playing Soviets, playing yellow, this is Dimon. An obvious fan favorite, adding on that flak cannon as well. He is worried about anything that this allied player might be trying on this map. Bear on the high ground goes for the scout. Vindicator will be crossing the map looking for that engineer. Won't find it. Second Vindicator didn't find it. First Vindicator didn't. I guess they did find it, but obviously they didn't get the kill. And, uh, 
Oh, oh. Oh, no, he wasn't trying the fake out. I was like, are they going to turn back around and then try and go for the engineer? Like, they're crossing back and forth and crossing back and forth. And the flat cannon does actually finish. So, Damon does actually purchase it all the way. Most players do sell or do hold it as almost finished and then uh, cancel it so that they get the full refund instead of only half. Damage split across both Vindicators, so they will take a little bit of damage. And once again, we find ourselves in a yellow versus red match. The allied player playing red. This time it's Soviets who will advance on to face DDF in the upper bracket finals best of five. Dimon and Pika, this has become one of my favorite matchups to watch over the last year or so. And I'm glad that we get to see it at least once here. I am kind of sad that it's only a best of three, that we don't get to see a bit of a longer series between these two. I could watch a best of seven, best of nine from them without any complaints at all. Vindicators escaping three of them, at least one very low on health. But the Bullfrogs did get thinned out. Their numbers knocked down. And as Damon goes for his third, he is drawing a zero on his bank account. He's a little bit low on cash, but he does know that his opponent hasn't grabbed that oil, Derek. So he does have that going for him. It's not much, but it is something. Bear gets cleaned up. Refinery comes online. Super Reactor will be after that. A very defensive set of plays from Demon. No fast sickle, no fast terror drone. He is convinced that anything like that would be bombed out by the Vindicators. And indeed, he's probably correct. Anything that he built other than Bullfrogs would probably get immediately annihilated by these Vindicators. But it is a little bit weird to see Demon playing 100% defensively. We're just not used to Demon being so much on the defensive. Uh, Vindicator's getting tagged. That's a bit of a mistake. It does significantly lessen the ability for these Vindicators to be able to drop their bombs and escape. In this case, the split of the Vindicators, which way they turn, does work in the favor of Pika. He's not able to clean up any Vindicate, any Bullfrogs, though, so the Bullfrog count doesn't need to be replenished. The Barracks does get added on, however. An additional Flak Cannon for safety will be mixed in there. Pika goes for the north side oil, Derek, leaving the south side uncaptured for now. And Javs will be meeting up with the Riptide from Pika. Riptide getting ready to move out. MCV as well packs itself up and heads for greener or maybe bluer pastures somewhere else. Are they going to go for another pass on this? Yeah, they're going to go for the refinery. I think they wanted something else, but they saw the bullfrogs coming and were like, well, we're already here. We might as well just drop the bombs on the refinery. Maybe we force an engineer to go in and heal up that refinery to stop it from being knocked down by the next bombing run. And that's one of those things where normally the allied player doesn't want to bomb a refinery because it just takes so many Vindicators to kill off a refinery. Uh, that's an interesting body block. That's a big boy body block indeed as that second war factory gets planted in what would be quite uh, possibly the worst place I have ever seen for a war factory. But it's going to be the super reactor that is the target. Twin Blade's going to try and trade out against the Javs. Does get two of the Javs. And that's good enough for now. Demon wanted to buy a little bit of time. He needs some way to stop these Javelin soldiers. And it's going to be up to the second Twin Blade. And oh, Pika stops the attack. So he will now be losing both of the Javs. And they might get the last rocket. No, he didn't get the last rocket that he needed to kill off that Twin Blade. So he stopped killing the Super Reactor. He did not get the kill on that. And he lost all of the Javs for only one. And the Riptide for only one uh, Twin Blade. So that's pretty difficult, or that's not, actually that's not that crazy of a trade, but that is an annoying trade there for Pika who clearly wanted something better. All right, that's not bad. When you hit the Harvester and it splashes the ore Refinery, that's okay for the Allied player. They're, they're pretty happy about that, but they don't like just hitting that, that Refinery for no good reason at all. And uh, they kind of take it as a consolation prize when they can't get anything better. No one has grabbed the garage yet. Oh, nope, no engineer inside of that. Well, no, it doesn't matter. 
Twin Blade does go down. Riptides both survive. Looks like no engineer inside of that Riptide. Does pick up that last Javelin soldier. And it will be satellites called down. A Terror Drone as well. And it will be the Naval Yard to get the repair on that Terror Drone. Or on the Prospector just in the nick of time. Does save that Prospector. A couple of moments later and it would not have been the same story. Demon takes the Oil Derrick in the south. Vindicators cut down another... Bullfrogs cut down another Vindicator, I should say. And it's actually going to be Bears, the Parrot Drop of the Bears, assaulting these jabs. And the Bear doesn't get the roar off. The other one was supposed to get the roar off. And finally, the Bear does get the roar, but it just won't be enough. The jabs shut it down. It'll be up to the Twin Blades to get the final kill on all of these Javelin Soldiers. And one jab does survive the first assault, but there's the additional Twin Blade to finish off that Javelin Soldier. Trades out the rockets on the Twin Blades. Might try and return for another pass, but no, the Apollo is here. More jabs on the high ground. The Super Reactor has been sold off, and the War Factory is going to be the next target. Damon says, nope, not going to try and fight that one out that way. Instead, I'm going to start a sentry gun out on the water, and I'm just going to rebuild my base over there. A couple of peacekeepers mean that a bear can't just be dropped in to deal with the jabs and try and shut them down before the riptides can clean up the bear. Meanwhile, on the north side of the map, the MCV hasn't gone tier two yet, even though it's gone all for all five refineries already. Instead, the tier two is going to have to be on this command hub back in the main base of Pika. Another reactor goes down. Pika trying to turn Demon into mincemeat as this game takes to the corners of the map. There's chaos in the mains of each player. Low power mode for Demon, and he's going to have to give a stop command to that Harvester, which he does just in time. Twin Blades will respond to the Riptides, and there will be no escape for these Riptides. Nice split of the missiles there. That's something that the lower level players don't manage to pull off, but Demon can. The other two Riptides will be able to escape for now. The Apollos hoping to find the Twin Blades, but instead they see the Bullfrogs and they return to base. Tesla Coil gets added on. Would like to see the fifth refinery to complete the set for Demon. Would also like to see the garage in the middle of the map get taken. And the Twin Blades, ever powerful, ever present, finally find those last two Riptides and knock them down. We haven't gone Tier 2 on the Command Hub yet, which is a little bit of a surprise. No Cryocopters, no Guardian Tanks, but the MCV has gone Tier 2 out on the water. So we have the hope, we have the potential of an aircraft carrier in the future for Pika because Demon, the longer the game goes on, it feels like the more opportunities that he has to pull you apart. And when it's Demon in the driver's seat, you never want to see that. War Factory is going to take a big chunk of damage from the satellites. The Apollos are here to push away the Twin Blades. Bullfrogs, do they get lucky? Pika gives away one, gives away the other. This opens the skies for the Twin Blades conti to continue their harassment. They can dodge in and out, move out of range of those IFVs. Fortunately, the Dolphins are here to distract. A couple of Hydrofoils are also here, but if that Tesla Coil finished up, then Demon does not have all that much to worry about. As long as he can keep these Dolphins from hitting right at the edge of those units. Uh, the Dolphin is going to have to use the Force Fire method. Yeah, they do manage to clear out that Hydrofoil. Naval Yard is getting added on. Demon is missing a little piece of the puzzle, and he hasn't found that critical damage just yet. He's been on the verge of cracking open the main base of Pika, but he hasn't found the ability to do it yet. The Terror Drones finally clean up the Dolphins. They finally chase away those Hydrofoils in Demon almost letting this game slip away from him. The control has been there, but he just hasn't been able to keep it on lock. And now the aircraft carrier is here. So now Pika might become the one in the driver's seat completely and fully. Not so much if he's just giving away Vindicators for no good reason as three of them go down. Only two of them dropped their bombs. Terror Drones return from killing off the Hydrofoils. They're going to look for maybe a couple of IFVs, maybe look for another target after that. 
Twin Blades escape to the middle of the map. Crusher Crane would be amazing for Demon. I'm surprised that he doesn't have one, and this Harvester hasn't been given the command to resume work, so he's just sitting there waiting, looking there dumb, but the refinery is exposed. The War Factory is exposed. The Twin Blades jump on it, and this is the damage that Demon was hoping for. No, he doesn't get the refinery. He doesn't clean out that refinery. So many Twin Blades low on health. Only one of them went down in that exchange, and that is actually a win for Demon. Losing only one Twin Blade in that moment is a win. He needs a way to deal with this aircraft carrier. This is the one thing that Pika has to truly and totally destabilize Demon. Demon felt like he had the answers to basically everything that Pika was doing until the aircraft carrier showed up. And that is why it is the perfect move from Pika. Demon is just going to try and go for the cross map. He thinks that he can knock down the main base of Pika while Pika assaults his main base from the water. The Twin Blades ever having to get chased away, ever having to look for an, uh, an opening and an opportunity where the anti-air doesn't just blast them to bits. Overcharge comes in from those Stingrays. Dolphins nearly running into the overcharge there as these Stingrays deal with the Hydrofoils, deal with those, oh, the Dolphins and the Javelins clearing out the attacking forces of Demon, and Pika will find his victory out on the water. The Riptide going for the kill. The Crusher Crane at the third might be the next target as the satellites rain down upon this War Factory. They knock down that power plant and the War Factory does get sold off. The build radius has been reduced. The refineries taken offline. Demon loses his own main base refinery and the other one is going to be following shortly thereafter. But the Hydrofoils stepped away. They left their heroic aircraft carrier unguarded for just long enough for the Twin Blades to come in and find a huge chunk of damage. Honestly, those Twin Blades could have committed into that attack. The Hydrofoils were just set to the weapons jammer, and killing off this aircraft carrier might be the thing that Demon has to do to be able to win this game. And now he's going to have to do it with the Stingrays. Coming in, Overcharge can be used. Twin Blades will get the guaranteed kill. One Twin Blade traded out for this, but the Hydrofoils will go down, and Demon has taken back control of this game. His main base is a wreck, but he's finally dealt with the Navy of Pika, and Pika has lost control of what he hoped would be the winning phase of this game. That act is coming to an end, and now he has these Stingrays, which are just directly assaulting his naval expansion. The multi-gunner turret is nice, and if it could help out this Riptide, then maybe Demon could be stopped. But when the Stingrays just go to the north side of the expansion, and Demon rebuilds in his main base, base crawling back to his refinery location. It means that Pika is falling further and further behind as Demon is rebuilding. Fortunately, Pika didn't actually lose the refineries back in his main base, so he can rebuild those harvesters, get that economy back up and working, and maybe eventually kill off these Stingrays, but not before they do even more damage. Take out another Harvester, and that will be it for game number one. Pika takes the L there, and Demon will enter game two with a one-point advantage. And as we come to Battle Base Beta for game two, no matter which way this series goes, we get to see DDF versus either Demon and Pika. And that's just a great matchup regardless, but the one who wins game number one is that much closer to the upper bracket final, and this yellow Soviet player is that man. This is Demon. Meanwhile, in the south plane, the red plane allies, this is Pika. Pika and Demon have shown us so many good games over the last year or so. They have become one of the one of my favorite matchups, and I would love to see more Pika DDF action. But if we get a return to Demon versus DDF, that's also really fine. I mean, Demon versus DDF is the tournament finals that we saw so so many times in 2020 and in 2021, and. 
it was pretty much always entertaining. Sometimes there were some weird ones where there'd be a 4 0 one way or the other. And, uh, you know, usually it was a good match. Usually it was pretty tight and back and forth. And even if the map score didn't reflect it, usually the individual games were really tight and back and forth. And it's like, Dimon definitely had a winning map score versus DDF. But, you know, that was also a couple of years ago. Dimon, maybe. Uh, a little bit better then, and maybe DDF is a little bit better now, so who knows? Pika versus DDF, I cannot think of a single time I've seen that matchup. So that is one that I am really excited to see is a potential upper bracket final matchup. Get to see them in a best of five, and then, of course, whoever wins that goes on to the grand final, and whoever loses gets a second shot at the grand final, gets a second shot at revenge, and that would be pretty cool to see as well. Vindicator comes in, Conscript's getting cleared out, and they will try and knock down that Oiled Eric, but at least Pika has stopped them from cleaning out his Oiled Eric in the first couple of minutes of the game. Dog comes in for the scout. Pika will run through the base of Demon and see everything that there is to see. He passed by the water expansion. He knows that it is going to be a move to the high ground, or I guess the middle of the map, but it is a move to the high ground for Demon. Meanwhile, Pika finds himself out on the water for his third, and then that means maybe his fourth will be here. Although sometimes people do like to do the kind of weird move of going over to the right side of the map from there and going for their fourth over on that right side. The first terror drone will swing over and hit that water expansion basically immediately. The Naval Yard does mean that the Terror Drone can't actually do any damage, but he can at least cause the mining time to stop, cause that income to dip a little bit. I didn't get the kill on your Oil Derrick. I don't get the kill on your Harvester, but I can deny that mining time just a little bit, and that is going to have to be the best hope that Demon can get from these opening couple of minutes. Reactor goes down. Vindicators will be able to escape. Macro-oriented openers from both players. And every single conscript goes down. And the last Peacekeeper jumps back inside of that building. So Pika will kind of secure his borders. He does have a very forward-placed MCV, but he can easily expand and then put some pressure with multi-gunner turrets into the middle of the map. Dog gets cleaned up. No scout for you, says Pika, or says Dimon to Pika. And we have now five bullfrogs out on the field. And we saw that very tight cluster of the crusher crane, the super reactor, the refinery, and now the barracks here on the right side of the map for Dimon. He doesn't go out onto the water. It looks like his MCV was packed up and he was heading in that direction. But he decides against it, and he will move back into the middle of the map. Multi-gunner turret's going to try and dislodge these units from that middle of the map strength position. No more strongholds for you, says Pika, and Demon will have to back on out. Crusher Crane. Not really getting a chance to do its job as these bullfrogs head to the front line, take a ton of damage, and then stay at the front line. Vindicators taking a lot of damage as well, but they will look for an expansion out on the water and be very sad when they realize that they're going to have to go into the potential danger zone of the main base, but they actually can swing through safely because all of the bullfrogs are in the middle of the map. A lot of loose damage landing on this Soviet army. Lots of hammer tanks are here, and the Vindicators come through. They get big splash onto the refinery, onto the harvester as well, and the Dolphin goes out to the water from Pika. He is playing this one out so close, so safe, nice and orderly. It feels like he has a very set plan, and everything is going according to plan, but he's going to have to contend with this hammer tank army sooner or later, and currently that is the one piece of the plan that is completely missing. He has no good way to deal with this massive army. He's set up with four refineries. He's set up with a naval yard. He's got the barracks and the javelins, but he doesn't have a ground army. Bear is coming forward. Multi-gunner turret gets 
added on, it will buy a little bit of time. Two Bullfrogs do go down. That's really good targeting from Pika. He just found those kills with that multi-gunner turret, and he bought as much time as he can. He needs an Assault Destroyer. He needs something. As the Vindicators come through, they're going to be able to clean up two or more Bullfrogs. One Vindicator traded back for that engagement. The Riptide gets annihilated immediately, but we need more Vindicators out on the map. We need something as the Bears completely shut down that barracks. The Cryo Shot is dodged, and the MCV is now on the run, but this MCV is so low on health, gets locked down, gets infected. Good game! as Pika will get dislodged. What a perfect setup from Pika for a game that was going to go on for another 10 minutes and not for a game that was going to end right there. Pika, a complete misread on the ground army strength of Demon, and Pika gets unceremoniously sent to the lower bracket. Not much of a fight in that second game, but boy, was that a beautiful setup from Pika that never came to fruition. And let's jump into the upper bracket final. And our first elimination game of the Christmas tournament will come here on Liberation Freeze. Some people have already been eliminated, but in terms of my coverage of the event, it all starts here in the north. He was knocked down by DDF in the first round. This is Andre. He's blue, he's allies, and his opponent in the bottom right side. This, as the red allies, is Dutch Army. Best of threes in the upper bracket, but it's a best of one here in the lower bracket. No mistakes. Every game counts because it's literally your tournament life on the line. It's almost like you're playing a series of ace matches. Because if you're like Andre, you've already played one round, or maybe two, I think just one round in the lower bracket to get to this point, and there's one or two more rounds in the lower bracket to be played out. The final round of the lower bracket, the lower bracket final, is a best of three, and that is what qualifies you into the grand finals best of seven. It is a bit of a truncated format. It is a bit of a shorter tournament, but it is also designed to be played out in over the course of one day and to not really extend things out. The Red Alert 3 tournaments tend to be very single day focused, and they tend to also be so that people can get in and get out relatively quickly without drawing them out to be like six or eight hours long. Riptide's coming out for both allied players. Dutch Army moves his MCV forward. He's going to be a little bit annoyed at the fact that Andre grabbed that oil derrick away, but oh well. One small win for Andre, and so far we'll see if he's going to be able to snowball that into a significant advantage. Andre, known for big turret pushes, sometimes chaotic and sometimes just like that's the only thing that he does in a series he'll turret push like three games in a row say in a best of five and in this case he only needs to win a couple of those to be able to go on to the next round and have a shot at the redemption in the grand final last year Andre was in the grand final he was there and he was coming in I believe from the upper bracket but he defeated, I believe, Demon and a couple of other key players to get his spot there. And here, he's already in the lower bracket, fighting that out with Dutch Army. And Dutch Army getting knocked down by DDF, getting knocked by, down by one of the upper bracket finalists. And, well, his opponent is going to be, in, in the next game, that is, is going to be another lower bracket game. So you play this one out, and then you get another lower bracket game with whoever wins the other side of this round. Massive Riptide armies from both players. It's going to be Javelin Soldiers trying to cut down the Riptides on both sides. Peacekeepers from both players. Not a lot of shield activations to try and extend out the life, but it just sort of becomes a mess of attempting to micro, and the lag, we don't have it here, 
but it might have been a little bit more present in game. Torpedoes will be coming out as these Riptides go out onto the water. A couple of jabs. No, it's just two Peacekeepers that have survived for Dutch Army, and he is now going to get the drop on a Riptide after Riptide. The double vet does get handed over to one of those Riptides, and Andre fighting under the defensive advantage of that repair is now going to be drawn out onto the high ground, drawn out onto the land as Dutch Army wants to make this fight a little bit more fair for his numbers advantage. He's like, hey, I should have a numbers advantage here. I shouldn't be losing, I shouldn't be winning these fights by th such thin margins. But of course, that is because of the repair of Andre. Double refinery on the high ground for Andre. He's also got that oil derrick as well, but the Vindicator is coming over. It is going to break down that wall, and it is going to allow Dutch Army to potentially get in there and stop this Harvester from harvesting. He is going to try and extend out this fight as long as he can, using his Riptide to draw the fire, using his Peacekeeper to try and reposition inside of the walls, but ultimately Andre is going to have to face off in a turret push or what is going to happen here because they are so close to each other, literally next door neighbors as the second power plant gets deployed by Andre and Dutch Army needs to find some way to break this position or else Andre is going to run away with this game economically. He is going to be so far ahead of Dutch Army. No big kill in the main base. He got that, uh, he got the power plant, but that has already been replaced by Andre. Barracks does get frozen. Andre drops both of his barracks a little bit further away. He's going to wait for his Riptide so he can have one big burst attack. And it's going to be low power mode, forced to sell off one of his barracks as this Vindicator is on Overwatch. And Dutch Army is actually going to let it die. Possibly a critical mistake there as Dutch Army doesn't have a whole lot of wiggle room here in this game. He is going to be going for the expansion. And unfortunately for Dutch Army, that Dolphin has forced that refinery to become or force that harvester to become a command hub. Engineer? No, he's not going for the capture. It is going to force the sell off though. And finally, Andre will retreat from the front line of Dutch Army. The MCV is now nearly in the main base of Dutch Army and Dutch Army is gonna leave the high ground and try to press his advantage when and where he can. Power plants getting sold off. Andre, if he tries to keep up the turret push, is soon going to find himself without power, without electricity to maintain that turret push. The infrastructure getting knocked down is good for Dutch Army, but Andre can become very powerful in these chaotic, messy situations where it's not clear what the build order should be. It's not clear how the knife fight should go. And look at that, the eternal fight, a, a walled up peacekeeper, a riot shielded peacekeeper against a javelin soldier. Barracks does go down. That might be an engineer that was built right at the last second there and got sniped by Dutch army. Peacekeeper is going to be forcing that MCV away, and the multi-gunner turret will get the cleanup on the high ground. One Peacekeeper, I think, inside of that building. Riptide's now going to be assaulting these Peacekeepers while the Vindicators get time to reposition and to refuel next to the MCV. Cryo shot fires off somewhere on the map. It's going to be going for the power plant. It's going to be going for the walls as well. And Dutch Army's power plants, now the infrastructure that's under assault, Andre is finally finding some more damage against Dutch Army. He gets a couple of kills, he gets knocked back, but now they're trading back and forth. Dutch Army going to be losing out on that third refinery, but he has not touched the third of Andre. He oiled Eric as well, the additional advantage for Andre with nearly 3K in the bank versus only the 1500 of Dutch Army. This is where Dutch Army needs to get the big wins. Splash damage on these Javelin soldiers is an advantage for Dutch Army, but is it enough? The Riptides, not enough firepower to be able to knock down this attacking force and Dutch Army's economy is about to disappear. He is down to just one refinery. He is in true panic mode and he needs to pull out an absolutely incredible defense against this game that Andre has been playing. When it's a best of one, Andre is a difficult player to beat. Sure, best of five, you might be able to do it, but when only one game matters, Andre can become the king. Onto the high ground goes Dutch Army. I think he's good, just going to try for a base trade. 
try for the old swaparoo. He's got 1,100 in the bank. Andre has almost spent his entire bank, and suddenly those multi-gunner turrets mean a lot less when you build them. They don't do anything, and you just sell them off. An engineer would be an amazing addition for Dutch Army if he was able to steal away a refinery without having to have, have the cash on hand to build it. Sells off the naval yard, sells off the airfield. Dutch Army trying to get enough cash on hand that he can actually survive this next encounter. This is where he really wishes he had a power plant just placed randomly out on the map, way out in the corner or something. And Dutch Army has enough cash to be able to get out a refinery, and he's got at least one more load of ore out of this refinery, and then he can sell off that refinery and uh, get as much value as possible. Although, he's not going to get much of anything. He gets nothing at all. The Harvester even takes another load of ore, and Dutch Army is now going to try and bring it down the main base of Andre so that he can take it over for himself. Andre gets another naval yard. Riptide production can resume. He could potentially even go Tier 2 if he wanted to try and get out Assault Destroyers. And Andre is now going to get a kill on a Riptide and Peacekeepers. Dutch Army giving away a couple of units here, getting caught and now killed. Vindicator's going to be coming in. There are a bunch of Javelin soldiers here, but the Riptides are going to have to pack up and run for the hills. A couple of Riptides going down. Airfield needs to be rebuilt, and that is actually what Dutch Army did. He does have enough cash in the bank, I think, to manage to sneak out one more refinery. He can sell off that command hub over on the water. He goes heroic on one of his Riptides, so he will be getting those repairs out on the field. And the Riptide advantage is now going to be here for Andre. Peacekeepers are going to be, have, be forced into close quarters with that harvester or they're just going to try and run and yes the refinery was purchased the walls coming in vindicators going up to heroic ranking up on these peacekeepers as well dutch army absolutely up against the ropes he's got very little left in the tank truly just a couple of hundred credits and not much more than that. Andre still has a refinery advantage against Dutch Army, and it's going to have to be some pretty amazing crushes because otherwise these Vindicators are only going to get one bombing run, and that is all that Andre needs is one shutdown of those Vindicators for his superior ground numbers to be able to take the rest of the game. And for now... The MCV chases away those Riptides. The Harvester needs to get back to work immediately. It's still just sitting there. Oh, it might actually be trapped a little bit there. Unfortunately for Dutch Army, kind of losing out on that mining time in a way that wasn't really his fault. Those movement bugs can be so frustrating. One of those things that does happen completely randomly in Red Alert 3. Airfield is now up. Andre's MCV has gone AWOL. It's somewhere. Okay, so he's just taking back the main base of Dutch Army. Riptides come down. Heroic Riptide gets a kill or two. Apollo's now on Overwatch once again. Vindicator step forward. MCV uh, trying to draw the Apollos into the fire of those jabs, but it doesn't quite work. The Heroic Riptide did go down, but this other Riptide gets a rank up and the MCV may actually need to get some free repairs. Andre hasn't been able to close the deal. He has had the advantage for 80 or 90% of this game and Dutch Army has been evading his death up until this moment. Apollos take a bit of damage. Javelins and Vindicators, a powerful force, but it is truly the last ditch effort there is so little left for Dutch Army. Cryoblast fires off, forces the cell of the refinery, and even one of these Vindicators going to be ranking up because of that. Might actually get enough repairs to make it back home. No, the Apollos cut them down, and that Apollo goes heroic itself, gets that golden star, and will become a hero of his people. Apollo's escaping off to the north side of the island. Andre so close to finishing this one out and advancing on to the next round, but he just can't quite manage it yet. Riptides will get jumped on. Vindicators come in. Another Vindicator gets shot down in these Apollos, thinning out the air forces. The only hope 
that Dutch Army had of advancing to the next round was his superior aircraft, and that advantage has been disappearing over the last minute or two. Javelins have yet to shoot down a single Apollo. They have just not found the damage that they desperately need against Andre. Javelin soldiers popping on out. Peacekeepers popping out as well. Heroic Peacekeeper trades away to a heroic Riptide. And it's all about the micro between these two players. One Vindicator could absolutely destroy Dutch Army, who has 583 credits in the bank, hoping that this freeze wears off, hoping that the winter snow melts and that he can get back to work he's so close to surviving and this hospital a clutch move here from dutch army if he could get out another refinery then maybe he could have something and his harvester gets back to work but once again andre has the advantage deciding enough is enough andre with his 2k bank is going to move up onto the high ground, potentially take back a fourth refinery and keep the advantage rolling. Dutch Army has not been able to shut down Ed Andre conclusively in any quadrant of the map, but Andre has had a really tough time killing off the very squirrely Dutch Army. This guy is a chief of evasion dodging and weaving, skipping everything that happens. Anything that comes close to killing him off just gets knocked down. And this Javelin, this Riptide combo can get three more kills. He needs the repairs if he's going to survive this fight. More Riptide's going to be showing up. Dutch Army's last chance to take this game because there is so much more that he has to kill with this one single heroic Riptide. If he loses anything, it's pretty much the end of the road for him. Another Javelin soldier shows up. Another Javelin soldier gets shot up as the Peacekeepers come in. And this should be the end of the game for Dutch Army army dog comes out no bark gets off the peacekeepers will tear down that barracks and this riptide has had a heroic run but it all comes to an end here for dutch army his tournament life on the line and andre will be the one to snuff it out a chaotic game here on liberation freeze but the liberation is finally coming through for andre into the next round the the airfield goes down dutch army gets a crush and he's got 1,100 in the bank. Technically, he can rebuild the airfield. He goes for mass walls. I mean, an MCV could, in theory, crush this entire army of Andre. In theory, the MCV could completely destroy the entire army of Andre. And I mean, other than that, he's got Apollos, but Apollos can't shoot down, so it's not that big of a deal. Dutch Army is, uh, he's got a flaming harvester. He is out of this game, but he is still fighting this one out. The hospital will be taken away from Dutch Army. Every advantage that he almost had, everything that was going for him, just gets taken away by Andre. And the dog is coming out to take care of that heroic javelin soldier. Dog feeling good about how that engagement went. Cryogeddon will fire off. The return fire comes in. The Vindicator will fight against those jabs, and that's the end. Bye-bye, as Dutch Army has only $800 in the bank, and Andre continues to encircle him. Barracks is here. Dutch Army, without really a hope of taking this game, is going to... Move down onto the low ground. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the plan is here. He is going to be able to get a little bit of cash back for that command hub. Uh, technically, he could take the oil, Derek. He could use that to get uh, an economy. Any economy, literally any economy at all would be nice. For whatever reason, Andrew hasn't built... Any, I don't know why Andre decided no war factor. Oh my gosh, if these Vindicators weren't here, this would actually be like the biggest kill I have seen in a long, long time. But Dutch Army has been defeated. Andre almost loses his entire ground army to a single Peacekeeper, but that 
will do it. Andre advances on to the next round. Let's see who he's going to be facing in the lower bracket with this next match. And that will send us back to industrial strength for our next match. The lower bracket where we'll see another player eliminated from the 2022 Christmas tournament in the North playing the Soviets as the green. This is green alert. We've seen him in team games. We've seen him in weird matches. And now it's time to see him in a straight up 1v1 against an airfield first allied player against the red Pika. Sent down to the lower bracket from a match with Demon. And now he's up against green alert. And this is a bit of a mismatch. Dutch Army and Andri. They are far more evenly matched. Dutch Army hasn't necessarily had the same tournament performances that Andre has, but he's taken Andre down in show matches. He's played 2v2s against him, and he goes blow to blow with him. Pika and Green Alert are a bit more of a mismatch. In this case, Airfield first does mean that Green Alert got both of the oil derricks right from the get-go, and that is a fantastic start for him. Okay, he's going Flak Troopers, which could turn out all right. We will see how he deals with the Vindicators uh, through the use of his Flak Troopers. For now, the Vindicators are going to be able to split their bombs a little bit and clean up a number of those Flak Troopers, and that is a huge win for Pika. Gets a number of Flak Troopers, and that was uh, five, two grand. Yeah, two, 2,400 worth of flak troopers just eliminated with not a single vindicator loss and this is a four vindicator pika so he is expecting to be killing some bullfrogs he is ready to go toe to toe with that soviet anti-air and knocking down a bunch of flak troopers right at the beginning when your opponent spent almost like spent more than a refinery's worth getting black troopers that you now get to just knock down okay he was expecting one of those to be sold off neither one was sold off and so the result is they both survive and it'll be up to the next bombing run to knock them down barracks does come up from pika third refinery up a little bit slower for pika but that's okay he's going to be feeling pretty good overall double barracks gets sold off green alert getting his legs under him perhaps and reorienting for this match. Conscript's not going to be able to take down these Javelin soldiers, it seems. They will be dislodged and removed from their place of residence. Moments before that Javelin soldier actually goes down, the Conscript is forced out. Eventually, the power plants did go down and Pika does create a bit of a lead for himself. Naval Yard for the Bullfrogs. It's not my favorite thing to see, but in a moment of desperation and difficulty, it is certainly something. And that engineer, this is just a mistake from Pika. He just got a little too bold. He thought maybe Green Alert wasn't paying attention, but he was cutting corners and he paid for it. That engineer goes down and Green Alert gets a couple of minutes, like maybe another minute or so with that oil derrick, cranking away, earning him more and more cash and Pika is going to have to build another engineer and then go for the capture after that. Green Alert is now going to probably play a very reactionary game. Pika is pretty much going to be in the driver's seat, and Green Alert will be holding on for dear life until he eventually falls away. If Green Alert doesn't find some way to bring a really good set of counters to knock Pika down, then Pika will just run away with this game. He's the better player mechanically. He has more experience in tournaments. He is the better player in terms of high-level play and knowing what to do at every stage of the game. And it is going to be up to Green Alert to find some way to knock Pika off his rhythm. Sometimes we see that through really, really good defensive play. The player who is quote-unquote better comes in, they're feeling a little cocky, they make some slip-ups, they overcommit to some situations, and the, the lower-level player plays defensively and then gets a couple of big wins and is able to snowball that 
into a win of the game. I love this move from Grinnell going for the attempted crush. That's another thing, just like the engineer earlier, where if Pika isn't paying attention, if he is just being a little bit lazy, then Green Alert gets a kill there. He crushes all of the peacekeepers. Or here, Green Alert gets the kill on the peacekeepers with the bears. He's going for another roar. He's going to chain this. He's going to be able to clean up a decent number of peacekeepers. And in terms of just pure value, these bears are absolutely paying for themselves, knocking down the javelin soldiers. Every jab goes down. The refinery gets saved, and Green Alert makes the defense happen. That was not the big main army. That was the appetizer from Pika. Couple of peacekeepers, couple of javelins walking through the front door, and that is not full power. But knocking that down shows that Green Alert is actually here to fight it out, and he is not going to just lay down and take whatever comes to him and then roll over and die. He is legitimately going to try for this game, and he is in a good position to make this a close game. Stingrays on the out going to be looking for the kill on a harvester pika is not immune he's not invincible and he will lose one harvester and this dolphin as well is going to have to run for the hills pika not bringing his vindicators in he never really clipped down those bullfrog numbers and so he's going to be looking for the cross map he goes out he's gonna find a bit of damage out on water but it is just going to be knocking down stingrays knocking down reactors that sort of thing Meanwhile, these dolphins getting fried. The naval yard gets sold off. No multi-gunner turrets. Pika not expecting this attack at all, not scouting it, not realizing the danger that his water expansion was in. And yet, Pika now finds the next stage of damage, which is to clear out the entire main base of Green Alert. Green Alert killed the expansion. Pika killed the main. And now he can go for the third after that. Couple of Stingrays going to be moving in. If we had Twin Blades, if we had some aircraft out on the field, maybe things would be different. But the Bullfrogs have not come anywhere in close to the Vindicators. And so these Vindicators never got cut down. Their numbers were never reduced. He was never put... The, the fear of God was never put into these Vindicators in any sense. The Bullfrogs never closing the distance, never finding a kill. And now that Harvester goes down. The Terror Drone will get the Infect on the Riptide, which is nice. The Bear's trying to blo body block that Riptide to stop it from escaping, but ultimately it will die before it gets too much further. Anything inside goes down with the ship. And the Stingray's returning. Still no build radius here from Pika. He deploys the Naval Yard. He was, you know, a little too cavalier with that water expansion, but he's done his damage on the other side of the map. He's found the kill on two refineries and a harvester. Green Alert zeroing in on cash, truly zeroing in. And Pika at 4.5k in the bank. More than enough to sustain himself, more than enough to keep this rolling into the late game. And one thing that Green Alert has never been able to do is establish any kind of a traditional army. He went Naval Yard as like a, as like a save my life reactionary move because he was getting dumpstered by Vindicators and he needed Bullfrogs and he needed them as cheap as possible. The refinery survives, are you kidding me? And then the result is there has never been a competent ground army from Green Alert. Okay, he forces the sell-off of the refinery. These are the moves of like a uh, of a burgeoning player, <laughs> of a player maybe at the beginning of his upward curve where he's getting these kills. He's not just falling apart. Like if it was me, I'd be dead by now. I would have been dead three minutes ago or something. I would have never even gotten this far in the game. And green alert, he is pretty far behind in every sense. I guess the only advantage that he has is the tech. Okay, no, that wasn't the tier two finishing up. Uh, the only advantage that he has is that his tech is ahead of Pika. But Pika honestly doesn't even need cryocopters to make this game happen. He's just showing mechanically that he is purely better. His decision making, his ability to find those angles, his speed is just all superior to Green Alert. But I appreciate Green Alert putting up this much of a fight. You know, giving Green giving Pika a bit of a challenge, not just laying down, but you know, fighting it out as well as he can.
Pika again with nearly 4k in the bank. Green Alert with less than 1k. Green Alert can't even build another refinery, and he's about to lose his super reactor, which is the tech that he hasn't really been making much use of. Riptide does go down. We haven't seen Akula subs. We haven't seen Twin Blades. We haven't seen Hammer Tanks. Well, actually, he maybe built one hammer tank, and we just haven't... Hey, there it is! There's the hammer tank. He got one unit built with that super reactor. <coughs> and the bug on this harvester, the movement bug, is just adding insult to injury. And that's something that he is receiving a disadvantage from that is legitimately not his fault. And Green Alert here needs to make an amazing attack happen. Five refineries versus three, plus an oil derrick for Pika. And Pika has the ground army. Well, actually, Pika doesn't have that impressive of a ground army. But Green Alert also doesn't have that impressive of a ground army. And so relative to each other, Green Alert is in a lot of trouble. If the context was slightly different... Oh, Pika even wasting a little bit of time and going for the Harvester that wasn't doing anything. He is going to kind of fix that Harvester path, maybe. No, but it will just be a smidge faster because it is a shrunk-down Harvester. Peacekeepers and Riptides coming to the front lines as Green Alert and Pika are almost certainly coming to a close. Pika reigniting his frontline assault. There goes the hammer tank, the last of the tier two units. The refineries have gotten knocked down one after the other. This is just a darn shame. It does make that harvester, I don't know, 10, 20% less efficient than it otherwise would be. Satellites getting dropped down at well by a moment of time a moment of time for that MCV. Vindicators come in. Dolphins circle around at the water to make sure that there's not some kind of sneaky hidden backdoor expansion or something. Reactor gets knocked down. Harvester will now get eliminated. Or refinery is next. And this is now a one refinery economy from Green Alert. He's got 3K in the bank, but not because he's got an impressive army or not because he's got an impressive uh, amount of income. It's because he literally has had so poor production that he just has nothing. Uh, that was a weird cryo shot in the middle of his own units. He's hoping that the MCV will freeze it. <laughs> and Green Alert is giving into it, literally memeing a little bit here at the end of the game and driving his MCV into the cryo shot. Green Alert has been defeated. A cheer for Green Alert for giving it his all, for making an attempt in this tournament, for showing up and fighting it out with Pika. He has done more than I did, and he survived much better against Pika than I would. So a cheer to Green Alert, and Pika will advance on to fight Andre in the next match. And that sends us to one of my favorite community-made maps, Deep Sea, for the next match. At least I think it's community made. As far as I know, this is not an uprising map. In the north, returning from his match against Dutch Army, this is Andre. And in the south, as the red, this is Pika. He loses versus Demon. He conquers Green Alert. And that does mean that Andre has had the tougher pool of opponents, but Andre and Pika are quite even in terms of skill. I feel like the last couple of times I've seen them play, Pika got the better of the engagements, but that might just be I didn't see all of their games that they played, and I just happened to see the ones where Pika won. And the other thing is, I actually don't think these guys have met in matches that I've seen very often. So again, I may be kind of remembering a very few number of games. No airfield first from either. They've committed to this double barracks money sink which you know it's kind of like battle base beta which i believe this is sort of a twist on and as a result you do have this double barracks peacekeeper truly like a money printer money sink just dumping 200 creds every couple of seconds down and out to try and take control of these buildings 
and they do this lovely little thing, which is a detail that very few people really pay attention to. You load the building up with a couple of peacekeepers, and then you send some peacekeepers out front because their shotguns knock down the opposing peacekeepers and keep them from advancing as quickly. It looks like there might be a slight bug in Andre's harvester. It does look like it's adding less than a second to the trip. So that's like less than a 10% reduction. It might be, you know, 3% less efficient. It looks very small, the bug there for Andrew, which is a little bit unfortunate. Normally it doesn't count, come down to like, oh, if I had 50 credits more. Normally the, uh, the differences become bigger than that over time. And we'll see. Defender's advantage is a powerful thing. And depending on how Andrew wants to play this game, that may or may not become a factor. In this case, he gets his third up, but his MCV is not sticking around near that third for any length of time. The MCV from Pika, on the other hand, he is here and he is present and still in his main base. MCV has lots of reach into the middle of the map. This might just be to dislodge this building and knock it down. That is possible and that is something that we have seen on Battle Base Beta and on this map, but you know, we're kind of expecting this to turn into a base push. This is Andre. He does love his turret pushes, and he will be adding on the airfield to potentially follow up the turret push with some Vindicator strikes and help him out in that sense. He's got a multi-gunner turret queued. There we go. Now it's out. He will start breaking down that building right on the edge of range, and now the Peacekeepers will be vulnerable to the Vindicators as well, but it's gonna be a little bit of I see you, you see me, and we're doing the same thing. It's just almost, it is almost a mirror of each other now that the MCV has moved forward for Pika. Kills on the Javelin Soldiers. That Vindicator has almost paid for itself now. Meanwhile, the Vindicator's coming in from Pika. Will need another pass before they do too much. They're gonna, you know, drop their bombs on something, but ultimately it's gonna be kind of just a trade of bombing runs. Javelin's going down. Vindicators are here. He's hoping to draw out some forces of Andre to be able to drop those bombs and get a little bit more value for his Vindicators. But Andre is getting more and more bombing runs out on the map, forcing that uh, multi-gunner turret down, but he does lose one. So no longer are the bombing runs of Andre coming for free. No longer are they essentially only cost positive for Andre. They are now having a little bit of a negative effect on his budget. Apollo is out. One Apollo, second Apollo will almost certainly follow. Multi-gunner turret is gonna try and push the front line forward for Pika. Another sell off there for Andre, and Pika is going to be looking to stop any kind of aggression from Andre. But now they're kind of in equal positions where either one could turn into the base pusher. Either one could try and extend this out by going for a war factory, by going for a slightly different play, but they're almost in a game of chicken, staring each other down, wondering who is going to flinch first, just doing this infinite trade. I don't think that was a spy. I guess that might have been. No, I don't think it was a spy. But that one single peacekeeper just approaching from the side like that was a little bit suspicious. I guess he would be a red peacekeeper then, not a, not a blue peacekeeper. In that case, if he was trying to fool Pika, Power plant goes down. Pika gets a little bit of positive damage there. Peacekeepers get the kill. Multi-gunner short will have to be sold off for Pika. Uh, he doesn't go for the cell. He's going to maybe force the Vindicators to drop their bombs where he wanted to wait until this other multi-gunner turret was online. For now, Javelin Soldier is getting knocked down, and this Peacekeeper almost unfreezes before the shots come in. Big rush as this is going to be a lot of frozen peacekeepers of Andre. Pika's having trouble actually capitalizing on that and they are going to now thaw out, shrink down of that MCV and Andre will escape a best of one means every mistake is so, so costly and Andre walks into a line of ice from the sky. His MCV goes on the attack and the engineer was produced to make up the difference. That was a good call there 
by Andre to get that engineer immediately and then sell off the barracks afterwards. And he's going to get a cryocopter. That's a cryocopter. And the Apollo escapes for Andre. He gets a little bit of damage back. One Apollo escapes, and then the second Apollo, which was doing literally nothing that, uh, that could have been sent home, does actually die. But Pika commits into an attack, which was relatively foolish, going for an Apollo against one Apollo, or using a, an Apollo to take down an Apollo that has repairs is never a good idea. Peacekeepers and Javelins going to be moving forward. It's two multi-gunner turrets versus one. The first has been broken, and the second will be broken shortly thereafter, but it does get sold off. A little bit of cash back for Pika, but not much at all. Airfield goes down. Apollo looks for the kill. The Vindicators escape for now, and the MCV has been given a new lease on life, and Pika is still looking to bring the front line a little bit closer to the home of Andre. Further and further north goes the front line of Pika. He's not pushing it forward with his MCV just yet. He was using his infantry to cover his Vindicators. And now, well, the War Factory is out. IFVs are being produced by Andre. Whoever wins this game goes up against the loser of the upper bracket final. So whoever that is, it is going to be DDF or Demon. And we're going to be taking a look at that best of five next. Another cryocopter goes down. It is a tough road for whoever wins this game, but this is already a tough match for both of these players. We are past the rounds where there are really any mismatches. These four players that remain in the tournament are all pretty evenly matched. Demon and DDF on this day do seem to be on another level. But there is still always the chance of the comeback. Andre last year defeat Demon in the upper bracket, and he sent Demon down to the lower bracket where Tsukspitsa dis dispatched him. But... Tsukspitsa uh, has not shown up for this event, and so Demon, Andre, Pika, and Didia are the big dogs, and they all have a chance. Legitimately, they all have a chance to take this tournament, even with it being weighted a little bit in favor of DDF and Demon. We've seen Pika and Andre defeat both of those guys in the past. It's a little bit of a square. It's like we've seen A beat B, B beat C, C beat D, and D beat A. So in theory, they can all defeat each other. Andre, always able to sneak out these expansions. As much as this guy has a reputation for being a turret pusher and a well-earned reputation, uh, no mistake. He is also in these games always aggressively expanding. He is the first one to make a move for a new expansion. And in this case, he takes the third first and his fourth first, even though he's about to get that fourth knocked down. It does potentially leave him vulnerable on the land as his IFVs are out of position. And this refinery has yet to actually pay for itself. As he gets this last load of ore, the refinery will pay for itself, but not all of the other stuff that Andre constructed out there. However, Andre is enjoying a little bit of a cash boost over the last minute or so. He is going to have to make do with rebuilding his power plants, wasting his precious money rebuilding power plants in the middle of the map. Guardian tanks are here. Andre, if he gets lucky with the crushes of Pika, he will be able to knock down these Guardian tanks extremely cost-effectively, but let's see what the IFVs and the Peacekeepers can do. One Vindicator down and one Guardian tank down, but it's going to be a trade back for an IFV. And the IFVs are cheaper, but the Guardian tanks represent a more long-term threat against Andre. The fourth refinery comes up for Pika as he knocks down the fourth refinery of Andre. And so Pika maintains a bit of an edge, a bit of an advantage over Pika, over Andre in this game. That refinery probably did get close to paying for itself, but not quite. Paying for that whole little expansion out there. As long as Andre can keep Pika's attention on the Andre... I don't know what I'm saying anymore. As long as Pika can keep this expansion safe, he is going to be in an amazing position to take this game. He's got the Civ structure there. He's got the Apollo running laps around the map, looking for openings, looking for opportunities. 
Cryo shot fires off. It will be a rush in of that IFB, but the IFB just gets the multi gunner turret. He doesn't get any extra value after that. And breaking the multi gunner turret without the Vindicators is exactly what Andre was looking to do. Sells off his barracks to try and keep his balance alive as his as he's drawing close to zero. Pika drawing close to zero, but with four harvesters with four refineries out on the field he is going to be feeling better about his position with every moment that goes by he already had the guardian tank advantage he already had the ground army advantage and it is growing by the moment again andre could still find a really good defender's moment but pika has played this one out so carefully and so nicely that he is super well set up for the end of this game. The only step that he's missing is actually, he's not missing it. It's tier three, it's Athena cannons. That is what I was going for. And he is already literally pressing those buttons as I'm saying it. The first one is emerging. Vindicator is heroic. Uh, second Vindicator flies a little too close to the sun. Pays the price. Takes down a couple of uh, peacekeepers with him. Well, a little bit of health off of the peacekeepers. And as soon as the Athena Cannon shows up, you go, uh-oh, we have a problem. We have a big, big problem, especially if this is Andre getting his Tier 3 because you just saw it bottoming out. He doesn't have the income to keep that rolling. Cryocopter stops the Riptide. That could have completely disrupted the attempt of Andre. But andre still has hope alive he just needs a way to deal with this uh, with these athena cannons and without the airfield it is going to be a tough call but he can you know try and wait for a mistake that's sort of the state of the game that andre is in i sure hope you make a mistake because you're you're in the lead and you've been in the lead for the last little while so I really hope you send your Athena cannons forward and I get to just kill them for free. That would be super cool. And that's kind of what Andre is hoping. Naval Yard gets deployed, but it gets spotted basically immediately. Vindicator will clean that up. Heroic Vindicator absolutely blasting that Javelin Soldier. And Andre has done nothing to change his situation. Nope, he has. He's got tier three. He's finally got that online. And uh, no airfield rebuild, it looks like. So he's down an expansion. He doesn't realize he's down an expansion. He thinks that he had a fourth for a little while. And then Pika took it down. And then they've both been sitting on three bases. And that's just where things are. But that's not true. And on top of that, he has an oil derrick that Andre does not. So Pika has a fourth refinery and an oil derrick and has been cranking away at those two things for a good long while. The Athena Cannon Wars can be won by Andre, but again, he's just sort of waiting for Pika to make a mistake. He's hoping that the cryocopters will sort of get him a free win. Like, the cryocopters will shrink his opponent's Athenas, and then he'll just roll in and be like, Hey, I didn't notice that my Athenas ran into all of your peacekeepers. EMP lands, cryogeddon will be the next step, and Pika says it's time to end this game. Cryocopters step forward, cryocopters get knocked down, but it's the cryogeddon that'll be the return fire. It'll be the saving grace of Andre. At the same time, Andre is moving forward with his own Athena cannon, and Pika... He could be way more aggressive. Pika is giving pause because he has an aircraft carrier assaulting the main base of Andre. Two aircraft carriers. The count of refineries is now two to four plus an oil derrick. Pika could have really pushed into that. He could have played around the edge of that cryogenin so much more than he did. He played that out very safe. All right, it is truly down to one refinery for Andre. This is a slow choke, a slow burning down of every hope, of every opportunity that Andre has of coming back in this game. He literally has $1 in the bank. Whatever cash he had is now gone as the GG comes out and Andre has been defeated. No big final battle, no last attempt, no final strike for hope and for victory against all odds. It's just 
the loss. And unfortunately, Andre drops out of the tournament and Pika will go on to the lower bracket final. So now let's find out who will be meeting him there coming from the upper bracket. And then there were three, and we're back on Infinity Isle to see who it is who moves on to the grand final and who will drop down to face off against Pika. On the left side, playing the yellow, playing Soviets, it's Dimon. And on the right side, playing red, drawing Empire. This is DDF. All right, so from our perspective, DDF has played Empire every single time, and yet... He has been random getting Empire every single time. And this is what I was talking about. You can get these weird sets. For all we know, DDF played a couple of uh, random matches in between. Sometimes players will play matches while they're waiting for other people to finish their matches. And he could have played random in those and gotten, you know, like allies and Soviets every single time. And he gets Empire here. But from our perspective, DDF has played random four times and he has drawn Empire four times. And that is, again, from our perspective, kind of just a funny little twist that we have going on. The last time we saw DDF, it was against an allied player. Now he's against a Soviet player who's planting a bear to disrupt those walls. In the previous Christmas tournament, it was Tsukspitsa who gave Demon trouble, an Empire player who knocked Demon out of the tournament, and he did it with walls the dude was using walls like force fields splitting armies into sections so that he could divide and conquer knock them down one after another this bullfrog chasing that burst drone chasing him chasing him chasing him not catching him meanwhile on the north side it will be the terror drone coming in for the scout, but also hoping that the walls were incomplete, hoping that there is some easily exploitable weakness that could be fine. And indeed, there is not. Burst drone does take a chunk of health off that sickle, and it's gonna be up to the Tangu to try and get a couple of shots as the sickle goes for the jump. The Harvester has stopped in the middle to deny that sickle jump, and look at this, the perfect kill, but it's actually not the perfect kill, and that was not a complete lockdown of the inside of that refinery. Sentry gun gets added on, War Factory is up, Super Reactor after that. It's looking pretty normal. It was a fast three refineries. This is not that crazy on the high ground. It does leave you a little bit of vulnerable. However, DDF got a pretty good sense of exactly what Demon was doing. Utilizing that burst drone, he did sort of see what Demon was up to. He knew that the threat wasn't that present. And it will be the Tangu dance with these with this terror drone. The Terror Drone can be microed back and forth, but it is a little bit annoying, and the result is these Tangus are just going to get frozen there for a couple of seconds, and then eventually the Terror Drone will have to go away. And these guys just switching it back and forth. There might actually be a way when they stack on top of each other to force fire the ground and get them both. I'm not 100% sure. That's actually pretty funny. He gets them both, and that is... No, he's actually switching back and forth. So he was microing that Terror Drone manually, and the Hammer Tank is going to get both kills. That is delightful for Demon. A little bit sad for DDF coming into this best of five to lose two Tangus like that. But when it's literally just the other player outplaying you, how can you complain? Yari Minisub snipes the Chiro Drone immediately, and this refinery is safe. So it's going to be four refineries plus an oil derrick for the Empire player, and not yet there for the Soviet player. Akula subs out on the field. Yari Minisub goes down the splash damage to try and knock down that flak cannon, and it will be the secondary flak cannon that will have to be established to make this location safe. But that won't even be enough, and this Akula sub is going to have to try and, I don't know, do something. Although that Akula sub... I don't actually know what happened to it. It disappeared somewhere. It went down at some point. And DDF is starting to claim a couple of wins as the airfield gets added on for Dimon. Tier 2 gracing that mecha bay, but I think so far it's just been the striker that we saw earlier that was produced by that Tier 2 mecha bay. Tangu's going for the scout. Not a whole lot of harassment on the Dimon side of things. And let's see. Many players die because they build a Sputnik. However, Dimon 
might be able to win because he builds a Sputnik. He really wants to keep his MCV somewhere near the front line. I actually don't know where his MCV went. It's right there. I found it. I got it, guys. I'm not totally inept at finding things with my eyeballs. Tangus will search over the left side of the map. Tier 2 is up, but I would not be surprised if DDF just hung out there for a good long while. He hasn't gone Tier 2 on the Naval Yard. He is going to be keeping that one Tier 1 for now. Although eventually... Wow, he's going Tier 3 so much faster than I would have predicted. I was just going to waffle on about how he's probably going to stay on Tangu Tsunami VX for a good long time. But no, he is going straight up to the possibility of Shoguns or maybe, okay, maybe not Shoguns. Look, everything I say is wrong. That's all you need to know. Uh, or he just goes for Wave Force Artillery on the land. I mean, he's not upgrading his Naval Yard, so it doesn't appear to be the indicator out there. He might be a little bit worried about the longevity of the Naval Yard. As soon as you upgrade it to Tier 3, that's, of course, when your bad luck strikes and a bunch of Twin Blades show up and basically burst it down. Sputnik gets deployed. Sputnik gets sold off. Tesla Coil is here, and Yari Mini Subs are going to have to be sacrificed to get the kill on that refinery. This Harvester gets called off the line. I genuinely don't know why. If the, I guess he's, he's he knows that the Terror Drone won't infect, and he just doesn't want to get locked down, but it's sort of like, I don't want to lose mining time, so I'm going to lose mining time so that I don't lose mining time. But then the Yari Mini Sub turns away, so now he's going to be losing the mining time anyways. I don't know what's going on with that DDF Harvester. He kind of shot himself in the foot before he actually got shot in the foot by Demon. Tangu's going to show up. MiGs get one striker, but not the others, and the MiGs escape for now. So the Naval Yard will once again be washed away by the Tide. That is DDF. He finds another kill, but he is yet to get any real critical damage done to Demon. Not that Demon has done, like, massive critical damage to DDF, but it's just been this dance past and towards each other without ever really doing significant damage to one another. Tier 3 on the Mecha Bay, but this is what I care about. Tier 3 on that barracks. It's on the way. And he's going Tier 3 everywhere, or at least Tier 2 out on the Naval Yard. And that is something that Demon is going to need an answer for, and that is why he has the safety naval yard way back at his back door, his water expansion. And also, just for all of you who always ask for it, you say, why don't people build battle bunkers? And the short answer is, they don't really think they're worth it. And the long answer is, well, people sometimes do, but uh, they don't really think it's worth it very big difference between the short answer and the long answer you know it's just there's just a lot of nuance there in the long answer that you guys probably aren't prepared for Ta migs fly over tangus of the soviet player you could say <laughs> actually twin blades are the tangus of the soviet player if anything i mean obviously they don't shoot both up and down but they are that sort of single unit spam if you're playing mono battles twin blades are sort of the unit that you want they handle vehicles, they handle infantry, they sort of do it all. Buildings get eaten up pretty quickly by them. And Eureka can be overwhelmed as well. DDF has invested pretty big cash into his production facilities, into his tech, and let's see if it actually starts paying dividends because who wants an investment that never pays dividends like these MiGs who have gotten a couple of kills but not the damage that Demon was hoping for those Tangus are still roaming around the map, and I don't know that the Crusher Crane ever came online for those repairs. Wouldn't be surprised to see it added on, but for now it's going to be the Barracks from Demon. All right, Eureka is out. Wave Force are looming, looking for their targets. No Terror Drone, but it will be a Wave Force Tower. This game is going to be historic for that alone and possibly nothing else. Tangus go for the Transform, bombing themselves as the Yari Mini Sub hopes to shut down those Bullfrogs. And at the same time, this... Oh, the Akula goes down in the north, so just a waste of that Akula. The cliffs get covered in green, and the Bullfrogs will hope for another couple kills. The Twin Blades hoping to knock down Eureka, but she might need a little bit of support. Or maybe Eureka is actually the support 
for this Shogun Battleship as Demon has drawn this game out and it looks like DDF is the one with the actual answer. The faster four refineries, the more robust game plan heading into the grand finals. It's a best of five, and that means you have one game to give, and then things get really difficult. Wayforce on the low ground. V4 gets knocked down. And of course, this is where you can complain about the fact that V4s miss so many shots against units. They really are a building killer and not really a unit killer. Low power mode as the Shogun rocks up. The Twin Blades will show up and it will be up to these Tangus to knock them down. They're going to be able to unload a couple of rockets before the MiGs show up and now it's going to be the dance. Eureka is on the way. Twin Blades lock down one of the Shoguns. The Tangus show up for the rest of it, but it's going to be the Bullfrogs to knock down the Tangus and the trade does come in. The rush comes in from the Shogun, but it misses pretty much all of the Bullfrogs as the Bullfrogs escape to land and the Shoguns can reacquire their targets. Natasha is stepping forward to contend with Eureka. It's the back and forth. It's the dance. The two-step timing just will not slow down. From here, it's going to accelerate. Eureka goes down. Natasha is going to look for the snipe. Tangus go for the transform. And the refinery does fall. The, ex the distance does extend between these two players as Didia finds yet another advantage. His economy shifts even further into his favor. And finally, those twin blades will be dealt with, but so will the Tangus bleeding and dying as the MiGs trade out. But the MiG escapes and the Shogun runs for its life. Natasha never made it to the front line one way or the other. She ended up on the sea floor or in a building hiding away from the real world. And this dance just does not stop. The Tangus try and engage. The Shogun is going to have to sacrifice its life and get as much damage while these... Oh, he's going to actually get the refinery. Before the Twin Blades can kill him, he's going to get the refinery. And that Shogun has earned its keep. Two Shoguns, two refineries, a heroic status for that Twin Blade as it goes golden and the refineries get rebuilt by Demon. Two at once, his Crusher Crane is finally online and slowing down the uh, the production of Demon is one thing that DDF would like, but when he trades out that many Tangus, a Eureka and two Shoguns, it suddenly doesn't feel nearly as worth it. The Twin Blades did get cut down. The Bullfrogs, some of them got eliminated. But in the end, these back and forths still leave a question waiting to be answered. And that's when the big fight comes, when the big clash happens, who will actually win? Because both of these guys have had phenomenal engagements in the past, but I have to say... Demon has a winning map score against DDF in tournaments for a reason. Historically, DDF has been the one who has lost out every time that they meet. Maybe not every time. That kind of makes it... I meant, like, overall, DDF has the, has the losing score when they meet in tournaments. But obviously, DDF wins some of the games. He wins some of the series... And in this case, he's hoping to have that grand finals appearance with a one-point advantage in his back pocket. MiGs come in. MiGs go down. Both of them get annihilated by those strikers. On the north side, Eureka. Or on the north side, Yari's. On the south side, Eureka. As the Shogun moves in, once again looking to make short work of this refinery. The Crusher Crane is nearby as well, so that could be a secondary target. Natasha moving in to... Go for the snipe. It will be an easy snipe on one Shogun, but not on the other. Eureka moves forward. One Shogun goes down. Eureka cannot close the distance, and the Twin Blades are now going to move into position, but the refinery once again falls away. One Twin Blade goes down. The others hoping for the kill, but the Tangus are willing to trade their life, and it will be Natasha who gets the snipe, or maybe a lucky Twin Blade found the kill. The MiGs go down. The Twin Blades go down, and finally these Strikers have found their purpose in life, have found 
their validity, their reason for existing. And right now, it's to play Puppy Guard and to keep units away from that Shogun. One derelict Shogun waiting to be captured, waiting to be brought back online. And it will be the escape out to the water. The Bullfrogs hoping to clip the wings on a couple of these units, but they'll have to contend with the Tengus on the ground. And the Shogun is getting more and more shots as DDF once again looks to extend the lead between him and Dimon. Getting cash back on these ore collectors is key. Every dollar that comes back into your pocket after you lose the two refineries is going to be a dollar that you want. And Demon now skyrocketing up to 5k and then dumping his cash quite quickly. DDF trying to keep his macro under control and Demon with that cash back finally gets himself more online. Snipe comes in. Clears out another Shogun, a double vet Shogun, but leaves the Yari mini subs alive. DDF, it feels like, has been trying to encircle Demon, trying to close the noose, and every time he tries, Demon manages to slip out yet again. But Demon is getting no closer to victory. He feels like he has been treading water for most of this game. He gets one striker, but not the others. A fair kill but the V4s haven't pushed the front line of the Empire player back any further than the middle of the map. There's basically been one player who has been able to get some damage done. Oh man, these veteran heroic units just cannot survive. And the Yari Mini Sub is going to miss its Kamikaze run, but it will, uh, what is going on? Just make your decision as far as what you wanna do. Uh, okay. Yari Minisub does get the kill. Wave Force Artillery. Are they still here? Yeah, there is still two Wave Force Artillery. DDF is wanting to play this one out very slow, very cautious, and Demon is happy to play that same game. It feels like DDF could have busted down the front door, but he has instead been trying to get a guaranteed victory with his Shoguns around the edges of the map, denying every water expansion, but unable to close the deal. Engineer goes onto the high ground. The Tangus will just miss the parachutes by a couple of moments. And I don't know what that was. Why? What was that? If anyone can tell me how that engineer died, was that a visual glitch where the Tangus actually did get like one shot, but uh, we just didn't see it? That was weird. Oh, the wave force. The Wave Force might have actually got the snipe, and that's why we didn't see it, because it just makes, like, the smallest spark when you fire off early. Uh, if you didn't know, you can preemptively, premature discharge, they named that very carefully, but you can fire off the Wave Force artillery early for a less damaging shot. So it does less damage, but you don't have to wait for the full charge and it doesn't have the full attack animation as a result. So that engineer, I think, got sniped by a wave force artillery. Terror drone goes down. Yuriko steps forward once more on the battlefield for the third time. She has done nothing in this game thus far, but she's hoping third time is the charm. V4s break their warheads apart, and the front line gets pushed forward. Demon. He has historically won against DDF, but that doesn't mean he will win here today. And indeed, his chances at survival seem to be shrinking by the moment. War Factory is here. Economy may be getting shafted, but Demon still has a ground army, so he can still keep his hopes alive if he finds some amazing engagement. It might actually be the Leech Beam of those hammer tanks. We've seen the double barrel hammer tanks turn the tide of some fights in the past, but the clock is ticking. Two more Shoguns are out on the map. Three more Shoguns are out on the map and the Wave Force artillery is blasting down the battle lab. The main base will be opened up and the B4 goes down. King Oni's on the front line, Tangus and Strikers. DDF is hoping to end this game and Demon wants anything 
than for this game to end swiftly. There's the kill of two King Onis. It will be the capture of one King Oni back. The, the Imperial Warriors coming to the rescue of that King Oni, getting a promotion. The Terror Drone extending out this fight. Twin Blades dodging in and out, avoiding those strikers in the current moment. There's too many Bullfrogs for the Empire units to take to the skies, and the Empire army is being thinned out moment by moment, bit by bit. If DDF can keep this up, then Demon will actually get the win because DDF's army is evaporating and he's gonna have only the Shogun battleships left. Yuriko goes golden as she gets that star and the ground army of DDF is actually disappearing. I cannot believe that Demon is making this fight as close as it is. DDF gets the MCV. Yuriko goes to the find her circus calling and DDF's army smashes into little tiny pieces. The Twin Blades might have to sacrifice themselves to deny Eureko, but at this point, there's probably too few of them. DDF will come through with the victory, but it has been a hard fought battle. And at the last moment, Demon will tap out. DDF gets the win. Demon almost makes the comeback happen. That battle was so much closer than it had any right to be. And DDF gets the first win in this best of five. And that brings us back to Battle Base Beta for our next match. In the north, playing the yellow, sticking with the Soviets. This is Demon. He's not playing random. He's going with Old Faithful. And finally, we get to see him with a new faction. What will it be as the allies? This is DDF. Playing random has its advantages and its disadvantages. Obviously, the first couple of seconds of the game, you have all of the intel and your opponent is in the dark. So something like an airfield rush, which is like literally the earliest airfield that is at all possible. It'll still be too late to get the engineer, but the earliest possible airfield is what we are seeing right there from DDF. And he had that early decision made and Demon had no idea what was on the way. Uh, the result will kind of be uh, DDF spent a lot of cash, doesn't have his second refinery up, and Demon is now having both of his refineries online. Demon has the oil derrick, DDF does not, and DDF is going to be following it up with an additional power plant just to keep himself solvent because of this airfield rush. So, the middle of the map goes to Demon, and eh, a lot of times allied players aren't going to contend the middle of the map against Demon anyways. You end up paying a lot for taking the middle of the map as an allied player, paying for those peacekeepers against conscripts. And I mean, hey, you may kill more conscripts, but you are going to waste your entire bankroll on just building, what in the world, that bear tucking in close and DDF bombs his own power plant. Very nice there by Demon. I mean, that's not a game winning move, but that is a lovely bit of annoyance caused to DDF where he has to bomb out his own power plant. Conyard goes to the high ground for both players. No water expansions thus far. And this, I don't know what this Vindicator is doing. He's just on Overwatch, to keeping an eye on exactly what is getting constructed out of that barracks. I guess he wants to know if it's a bunch of flak troopers or if it's going to be conscripts and bears because either way, Demon is going to put on a little bit of pressure and he's going to hope that this MCV doesn't have a quick answer. First bark comes off. It does win on the side of DDF but the second roar actually comes off in favor of Demon, and it will be the Flak Troopers barely out of range of that multi-gunner turret. They might try and bum rush it. No, they will wait there, uh, wait for the next moment at least. Demon sells off the barracks, gets his refinery up and running, and there is the third refinery for DDF. The front lines have been drawn. The barracks gets reestablished, and it's going to be low power mode, so this is the perfect moment for DDF. The moment has passed, or the perfect moment for Demon, excuse me. The moment has passed as the dog comes forward. It does get sniped. 
doesn't get off a big bark, doesn't get off a big shutdown of these units, and instead it will be the conscripts that need to clear out this peacekeeper, and that was almost the perfect kill of every conscript. No, it was! One Molotov cocktail landed, but it didn't clear out the peacekeeper, and that multi-gunner turret was manually controlled by DDF to clear out the conscripts in just enough time to maintain control otherwise if that goes down the next multi-gunner turret probably gets ganged up on and knocked down and then it's up to these peacekeepers to try and clear away these units one at a time the bears can camp the barracks and this game might look different than it does right now. If that MCV has to run for the hills, the power plant could die, the barracks could die, the refinery could be under threat, and DDF has so much pressure to deal with. But he saves himself and keeps Dimon from overwhelming him. I'm not sure what these Vindicators are doing. They've been hanging out. They've been spending so much time on the Demon side of the map. It's like they're looking at real estate. They want to find a new place to live. And they're not so sure that DDF is going to be providing housing for them, it seems. They're looking for some alternate options. Water expansion comes up for DDF. A very sneaky, quick expansion for DDF. Not something I would have thought he would be able to sneak out in this moment. He says, hey... Infantry were good enough for our forefathers, and they are good enough for me. Who even needs vehicles? As he rebuilds his airfield and places it right on the front line. Well, when you get four refineries, now you can suddenly afford things but that you had to cut and skip because you were getting out your e cut a little bit sooner. Goes for the expansion with the command hub and sets up that fourth refinery. I don't know, two minutes before Demon gets his? Maybe only a minute and a half. Either way, that fourth refinery is cranking, and actually, he can now clean up this oil derrick, which I think he was trying to do earlier. These Vindicators have just gotten nothing done. For as long as they have been out on the map, for as much as DDF rushed to them, he has been using them, I guess, as a security blanket and little other than that. It is possible that... The threat of the Vindicators has adjusted the way that Demon was going to play out this game, and so DDF has a win in that sense. But it just kind of looks like Demon has played a pretty regular eco-focused game. He did have the big draft of infantry to take control of the middle of the map, and those War Factory and Super Reactor were late by comparison, but it's not insane to have a little bit of a later is he gonna move his row his javelin soldier barely misses out on those toxins it's gonna be a good old time the toxins are a party color and that javelin soldier is missing out but oh well that's what happens cryo shot will be the return fire he's gonna catch one conscript and nothing else nice dodge by both players as they step forward and those big area of effect insta-kill kind of support powers come into play, they don't find any much effect for either player. Multi-gunner turrets are fine sitting in those toxins for the current moment. Two dolphins will ice skate their way up to the top side of the map and start knocking on some doors asking if they can sing some Christmas carols. And, uh, well, their song isn't very pretty if you're an ore harvester, but if you're an allied player, it is a beautiful song that they are singing right now. That splash damage on top of the ore refinery is even better as DDF finds a bit of damage and Demon will clear out the observation post, which takes so, so long because observation posts have always a surprisingly high amount of health. It's one of those things that is just so comical when you see it. It takes this entire group of units so incredibly long to break down a, uh, an observation post. Hammer tanks on the front line. They've got that leech beam working away at that multi-gunner turret. And I mean, two leech beams do take a good long minute to burn through a multi-gunner turret, but that's okay. Demon in the current moment feels like he has a little bit of time to spare if he can just slowly sap away the money of DDF. Airfield comes up, airfield goes down. You gotta think a little bit further ahead than that, apparently, as another refinery comes up. Wow! DDF finds the time to get out five refineries and knock down the fourth refinery of Demon. Demon finally going to be able to strike back against DDF, and he kills only a harvester. DDF got the entire refinery of Demon, and DDF is now gonna clip the wings on one of these twin blades. 
Goodbye, Twin Blade. He hasn't restarted the Harvester, but that is a small mistake for all of the wins that DDF is having in this game. Win after win after win for DDF. Total control, almost perfection from DDF. He had that one scary moment here in the middle of the map, and other than that, he has just been getting further and further and further ahead. Looking at the income card, you wouldn't actually realize that Demon is the one with the less refineries, with the no oil Derek. But DDF is spending every ounce of his cash that is coming in. And Demon is a little bit unsure of what to do in this moment. Part of it is he's rebuilding this infrastructure that he had, but look at that, nothing building on either of his production facilities. And it could be that he just literally is feeling like there is nothing to build that would be worthwhile, but he is completely flatlining in terms of production. No Twin Blades, no more MiGs, no more anything to try and get himself back in this game. I mean, I don't know, going for two more Hammer Tanks might have been a good use of money, but whatever it is, he wanted to wait for Tier 3, and now it might be... Like what, are they, what aircraft that he's, is he building that he's waiting for Tier 3 for? Uh, whatever it is, if it's not Kirov's, he could have been building that a little bit sooner, and now suddenly his money is disappearing. It's going to be the Iron Curtain. All right. So this is a longer-term play from Demon. He sees no victory in the next couple of minutes. The victory will be coming after that, it seems. And never mind. Demon cancels the Iron Curtain. He gets out the Kirov. Yeah, he really did want to go late game. He really did want to make sure that he has some big, powerful units that he isn't going to be falling behind immediately in the artillery war. And now DDF, he's got his five refineries. He's got, I assume, tier three. Yeah, he's probably pumping out Athena cannons. Might even be adding on some Mirage tanks sooner or later. Hammer tanks are going to try and gang up. It's going to be the cryo shot. Needs to dodge to the north. Maybe a little bit. Uh, one bullfrog does get tagged. A relatively small price to pay. I don't know if we have a lot of MiGs. This is two Kirovs. Okay. All right. Demon is actually finding some potential ways back into this. Number one, knocking down this refinery. If he gets cash back on it, then that makes it even better. Number two, knocking down this refinery. Hydrofoils are good but they can't stop two Kirovs, not one Hydrofoil by itself. Although one Hydrofoil could at least uh, stop one Kirov from dropping any bombs. And the multi-gunner turrets will be that early warning system. The other Kirov stays in the middle of the map. Demon has spent his bank and is now feeling the tightness of his wallet as he only has three refineries and he is late in the game. Aegis Shield does get popped. The Athena Cannon will be saved. Uh, run away, run away, run away. As these Mirage Tanks come to the front line, the Iron Curtain finally online. Two, a little under three minutes on the clock, and the Athena Cannon goes down. The Mirage Tanks are happy to trade out with a couple of these Hammer Tanks, but of course, DDF would like to keep some of these units alive, some of these defenses online, and the Multi-Gunner Turret does survive for the current moment. Going to take a moment to heal up and recenter myself, says Demon. Where did he end up putting that Iron Curtain? Okay, he just repositioned it a little bit. The reactors on the front line do get pushed back. DDF's bombing runs have accomplished something, but not a super ton. Not a super lot. I love the little hit from the Twin Blade. As long as it survives, I love that little back and forth, that little poke and run. Oh, that was almost a massive kill move for Demon. He almost knocked down 80% of the army of DDF. And DDF says, okay, you're going to drop toxins. I'm just going to go for your main. I have got five cryocopters here. I've got Athena cannons. I've got Mirage tanks. And I think if it comes down to a fight, I think I can take you. Army gets split up. Demon has to wait for the cryo blast to to wane, and this will be the pressure from the Mirage tanks. Hammer tanks getting trunk down one by one, and the infantry getting caught up. This is not the engagement that Demon wanted. Getting funneled down, and it will be the super reactor that goes down. The tech getting reset almost completely here. 
by DDF, but it's low power mode for Demon. So one way or the other, he is paying the price for this attack. And what he thought was almost a massive win with that Toxin drop turned into an attack for DDF that is paying huge dividends in this moment. Demon is down to one refinery, a war factory on the high ground. His Iron Curtain frozen in time, locked at a minute and 23. Demon's army cut down by 50, 60 percent. DDF lost his Mirage tanks, but he's the one with an income. He's the one with a strong economy behind this to keep up the production. Bullfrogs go down. Vindicators come in and sweep up the trash as the Hammer tanks hope that the Mirages somehow trip on their own cord and empty themselves and kill themselves in that moment. But DDF will take the win. The immaculate play of DDF coming through to defeat Demon and that economy graph helps tell the tale of what happened between these players. DDF takes two games in a row against Demon. And it will send us to deep sea for game number three. It's a best of five, so we are already at match point for at least this man in the north, returning now to his empire roots. This is DDF. And struggling to find a win in this series, playing yellow, playing Soviets, give it up for Demon. DDF is just out playing Demon. He's not necessarily doing crazy rushes or turret pushes or anything like that. He's just sort of out playing Demon. And Demon is struggling to find answers to both the Empire and the Allies play. A lot of it has been artillery based. It's been late game focused for DDF. He has been finding his wins pretty far into the game and not on, you know, small eco trick plays that you just don't see coming and how could anyone prepare for that? He's finding his wins off of like four or five harvesters, killing off his opponent's economy, making sure that Demon's economy is always smaller than his own, finding those advantages. Some of that might be the fact that Demon is playing against a random player, and so he doesn't ever realize at the beginning of the match, is this SVS? Is this SVA? Is this SVE? He just doesn't know. Maybe that would make a little bit of a difference, but it does feel like mm, DDF would have to be playing worse by choosing his factions, as well as Demon knowing what the matchup is for Demon to be getting the wins. Because it's not like Demon doesn't know the matchup, and then DDF is hitting him with these crazy trick plays, and it's like, oh, well, that's clearly the only reason why DDF is winning. DDF is just playing really well in this series. In this entire set of games in this whole tournament, DDF is just playing really well. Burst Drone gets the flyover. Demon and DDF, okay, all right. Giving DDF all this praise, all this credit. Doesn't even capture his own oil there for the first 20 minutes of the game. Okay, it's not 20 minutes, but you get the idea. He's got Tangus roaming the map before he gets his first oil there, which is not something you typically see from an Empire player. Going to be a pretty quick third refinery for both players. A little bit faster for DDF, of course. But he also did block, or expansion block, Demon a little bit there. So Demon is nice and quick with that expansion. Hammer Tank comes to the front line. Super Reactor, we saw that get added on earlier. And, well, this Sickle is going to absorb a little bit of damage here. Going to try and find a bit. Oh, that was a little bit unfortunate with the exact placement of those Imperial Warriors to not take any fall damage from that Sickle dump. And, that, eh, well, that's one of those things. Demon did a really good job of predicting, like, the exact middle of where those Imperial Warriors would be, which is typically what you want, but he just got... A little bit unfortunate that the radius of the sickle jump splash damage is just slightly smaller than the distance between those two Imperial Warriors. First Tsunami tank is out on the map, tier two for both players, and that Bullfrog barely ejects all of the conscripts in time. Sickle goes down, 
Bullfrog goes down, and this Tsunami Tank feels good as he returns to home with two kills and having chased that Hammer Tank away. MCV comes to the front line, and it is going to be the Burst Drone running another pass of scouting over top of that base. The airfield almost coming in clutch for Demon several, several times in this series. Those Twin Blades, they've gotten a lot done, but somehow Demon is still just not able to get the wins in these games. Tangu steps forward. That Bullfrog kill earlier feels really good now. And there's the transform. Terror Drone going to lock down that Mecha Tangu, and the Tsunami Tanks will escape for now. The MCB takes a little bit of damage, but not too much. Third Refinery Kranken for Demon. Oil Derrick for both players. And no big harassment yet on either side of the map. Where we go for the fourth refinery, or who hits the first big attack? We have yet to see, but that will be one of the tone setters for this game. And that's mostly been DDF in this series. Here he's going to try just straight up the front, and he's just going to knock down the hammer tank and say, you moved a little bit too close to me. You don't have the firepower to support this. You went with twin blades, but you can't stop my strikers. Terror Drone is going to guarantee three kills for this MCV. Three crushes on Tsunami Tanks, which normally would be a huge victory. But here, it's just the death of the MCV. Demon giving away this game as DDF outplays him here in the upper bracket final. Demon doing everything he can to try and maintain a position in this game to not just get knocked down to the lower bracket, but it seems inevitable at this point. DDF is just playing so incredibly clean. Demon tries to go in every direction so that he has an answer to everything, and DDF says, no, I didn't build a bunch of Tangus. I just built Tsunami Tanks, and now your MCV is way too close, and I'm going to kill you. And DDF backs off. He says, I don't need to win this game right this second. We can play this one out a little bit longer. You're either going to be playing from a disadvantage. No MCV, no one clicks, no support powers, no toxins, no satellites, all of those things. Or you're going to have to drop the five grand, the one minute countdown on that MCV rebuild. You want to spend 5,000 of your dollars at this stage of the game rebuilding your MCV? Well, you might be forced to. Barracks is here. It's going to get shut down. The Tsunami Tank's keeping up a little bit of pressure. Twin Blade's doing some damage to that heroic Tsunami, but never quite getting the kill. And I don't think there ever was a Crusher Crane established. Otherwise, this would be a little bit of a different conversation. Terror Drone will be getting the catch on that Tsunami, but the Tangu gets the kill on the Terror Drone, frees up that Tsunami, and makes those Twin Blades look a little bit foolish as they head forward for the kill and find nothing but empty ground. Tsunami Tank is going to eat up those Leech Beams for a little bit, but it's going to be Tank Busters, Strikers, and Tsunamis moving forward. There's only two Hammer Tanks here. Three Hammer Tanks now on the front line, but the Tsunami Tanks and the Tank Busters will win that fight every single time. There's almost nothing that Demon can do. The JG is inevitable as Demon gets crushed as the DDF moves forward, and the airfield will be the next thing to fall. DDF is hoping that this counterattack cross-map situation won't be some kind of miracle play, and indeed it is not. One Terror Drone gets the Infect, but the GG comes out, and DDF takes a 3-0 perfect series against Demon. Doesn't drop a map against Demon and heads into the Grand Final, where Demon will have to face Pika in the lower bracket finals. And for the moment, we will stay on the map Deep Sea for game one of this best of three. Feeling like he's getting no break at all in the north as the yellow Soviets. This is Demon. Meanwhile, in the south, playing red, not playing random, but choosing his faction. This is Pika. Allies versus Soviets, a rematch from the upper bracket semifinals. That was also a best of three. Demon won that handily with a 2-0 map score. You know, not going to say that those were easy games, but the map score was entirely in Demon's favor. Pika, not quite 
up to the task of knocking down Demon in that game. But always you get a second chance with the double elimination. Pretty late on the second refinery for Demon, but you know, it is because of this big spending in the middle of the map. This is a ton of conscripts, and actually the timing of the refinery may have been normal, but his bank account is so close to zeroed out because of how many conscripts he has built, how far he is pushing this across the map, and this is his opportunity to open up with a little bit of chaos, take control of the pace of the game, and get to do things his way. MCV getting caught up, either a misclick there from Demon, or he did just have a little bit of a movement bug where the MCV gets caught on something and doesn't continue for whatever reason. And, well, the conscripts go down. The Peacekeepers may be able to help clear out this building. And uh, one of the Peacekeepers switching over to that riot shield mode to hopefully absorb a couple of those shots and extend out the life of that attacking force. One barracks gets sold off, third refinery on the way, and this will definitely delay the third refinery of Pika. But now, well, all of the conscripts are gone, so the oil derrick is going to be the next target, and Damon will find a win here. A little bit of damage done to Pika. Good way to clear out some of that income, create a little bit more space on the map. You know, it was just feeling too cramped when you had that oil derrick still on your side of the map. If these peacekeepers get clocked by these bears, that could actually be a nice win for Demon. Refinery gets placed down, and the conscripts switch immediately over to their Molotov cocktails, and they are going in for the kill. They're going to force a response here from Pika. This is not a kill the refinery moment, but this is a force a response because you cannot wait for very long. Wow, they actually do a ton of damage. They're going to kill that refinery. Oh, my gosh. He got the refinery. He got the cash back as well. Can you believe that? He has so many conscripts at the beginning of this game that he gets the kill on the third refinery almost for nothing. Yes, he does get lose a whole bunch of, of conscripts because of that. And now he's gonna be able to knock down these peacekeepers as well. He might actually kill off this power plant. The big splash damage from the Vindicators might stop the power plant from going down, but it's gonna be big damage either way. He kills the power plant. Conscripts, conscripts alone are doing all of this in the hands of Demon. This is what happens. I cannot believe how much damage he has done with pure conscripts in the first part of this game. He has not won the game, but uh, it kind of feels like he's won the game already. I love the proxy command hub. If Demon wasn't paying attention, that would have been funny because then he could have gotten turret pushed by a command hub from a refinery that he killed off. But Alas, the attack will come to an end, and so will the game as Pika just throws in the towel. Like I said, it felt like he won the game with just those conscripts, and at the end of the day, he did literally win the game with just the conscripts. That is not what I expected. I love seeing that map, and that was a hilarious context to see it in. Let's jump into game number two. Four games in a row, we have seen this kind of aesthetic. Battle Base Beta, Deep Sea, Deep Sea, Battle Base Beta. Bouncing back and forth between these, between series from the upper bracket final to the lower bracket final. And now, with this tournament life on the line, because this is just a best of three, we are blazing through these games in the north. He needs your help. This is Pika. Meanwhile, in the south, going against an airfield first as the Yellow Soviets looking for a repeat. This is Demon. Demon opens with the double barracks. That first strike did so much damage in the last game. And here, it's going to be spotting out that Vindicator, but the bear has already given the intel to Demon. Demon knows exactly what is going on, and unfortunately the bear doesn't find the magic position next to the power plant to cause the splash damage, but still, he gets all of the intel that he needs. He's gonna try and kill something as he heads down the ramp. He might just split all of the conscripts between the buildings 
to uh, extend out the conscript lives as long as possible. You can fit a lot of conscripts in these buildings, and it does mean it's going to be more bombing runs, more wasted time for these Vindicators. And, I mean, they do have to split their bombs if they want to really do anything. Oh! That airfield is actually close enough that the conscripts can gun it down. I did not think that was possible. These conscripts are truly talented, firing from outside of the building in such a way. Uh, this must be a visual glitch. The muzzle flares are, I think, supposed to be there. And the flashes show up instead on the sides of the buildings, which looks kind of funny. And, well, you spend all the money on the airfield, and then suddenly it gets defeated by conscripts. Fortunately, the Vindicators do clear the building, and the conscripts all die in the splash damage. Third refinery coming up here quite nicely for DDF, but it's going to be a naval yard. Bullfrogs from Demon. And he wants to go for the faster third, so instead of the War Factory, he knows he needs the security. Reminding me of the Green Alert game versus Pika on Industrial Strength. But I think the transition out from Demon is not going to be like 20 Stingrays that uh, that try and make the magic happen out on the map. The, the Vindicators will kill off the Oil Derrick. Always nice for Pika to get that kill. And it will be a power plant out here. But no multi-gunner turret, at least not yet from Pika. He is instead going to just build something else and then move his MCV. It will be the naval yard out on the water. A dolphin probably on the way to skirt to skate around the map, take a look and see what they can find. Uh, wow, these bullfrogs are very aggressively placed. They're hunting themselves some vindicators, but they won't find any vindicator soup just yet. Splash damage? Nope, doesn't go for the splash damage. Still hunting for a better target. Walls will come up, gonna be forcing these conscripts to reposition themselves. The conscripts will be able to hunt for another target. Instead, I think it will be the reactor that pays the price for those Vindicators' wrath, as the Vindicators are hoping to do even more in their next pass. A couple of Stingrays are coming out. Two Stingrays on the way. Super Reactor will be the choice after that. And Demon is delaying his fourth refinery to get that Super Reactor out, which is definitely a reasonable thing to do. I'm not advocating for four refineries before Super Reactor off of a naval yard against Pika. I am not advocating for that at all. And uh, we'll see exactly what Demon does after that super reactor but he will get a little bit of pressure out at the water one stingray is his choice two stingrays is his choice three stingrays is his choice as he decides to go for those three stingrays and the vindicators just will not leave him alone conscripts finally finally getting cleared out of all of those buildings and yet they still hold this building there it has been a long time coming and uh Pika is finally making safe his home. Riptide gets caught away from the naval yard, so no repairs for that Riptide. It does, ooh, and this Hydrofoil is now going to get shut down as well. There's too many Stingrays here for one Hydrofoil to be able to just weapons jam its way until the end of time. Uh, but these Stingrays are not attacking the Prospector, which is sort of what you want. The Stingrays wasting their time. Bullfrog's going to come to the front line, and this will be a, pay, a price paid by these Vindicators. Two, no, the second Vindicator escapes. Three of the four Bullfrogs go down, and only one Vindicator gets eliminated. Javelin Soldier's now going to be finding the airfield, and no, that's it. Jimon taps out. The GG comes out, and it will be Pika who evens up the scores. Two swift games in a row for a 1-1 map score, sending us to the ace match. On the map, Murr's Landing, and this is where we will decide who matches up against DDF in the grand final of the 2022 Christmas Tournament. Will it be the red allied player in the South? Will it be Pika? Or will it be the chance at revenge, the hope, and the prayers of every Soviet player ever? This is Dimon. He's opening up War Factory first. He has had enough of these economic-focused openings, and indeed, it will be a very fast Vindicator. No barracks, no oil derrick capture for either player. It feels like normally 
you only get one player skipping the oiled air capture. It's never both players skipping the oiled air capture, and yet, in this case, it will indeed be both players skipping that oil derrick capture. First Bullfrog is out, and Flak Cannon does actually finish. Once the next couple of, oh no, he actually sells it off technically a little bit early, but uh, he has a good feeling about this, and he will be right. The Vindicators don't like suddenly swoop back in and insta-kill that Bullfrog in like the five second timing window when there was only one Bullfrog. Third Bullfrog is out. Barracks on the way also. Double refinery for Pika. MCV down to the low ground. Very short walk to your natural expansion. I never really uh, realize how short it is until I see this map again. I'm like, wow, it is, it is right there. This is kind of a three refinery map. In the same way that Infinity Isle, you almost always get that high ground refinery. You don't always get the water refineries, but you almost always get that high ground refinery. And that's almost a gimme. This is also almost a gimme. Refineries on the way. Oil Derrick Capture will come in, and Demon is actually going to go for the Oil Derrick Capture of Pika rather than his own. No, he's not. He is going to displace that MCV, and it's not going to work. That really stinks for Demon. His engineer almost had a glorious payday. He almost had a glorious disruption of that MCV, and then the Terror Drone was going to get the lockdown of the MCV if it packed up. So that would have been a tremendous one-two punch, which would have completely knocked PDF off the course of action that he wanted. It would have completely disrupted the build of Pika, and it wouldn't have necessarily won the game right there, but oh wow, it would have been so strong of a start for Dimon. And now, it's not. One win apiece, but of course, in the history of this tournament, Dimon has won three games, and Pika has won one of the four that they have played. Two best of threes. The first one is a 2-0. The second one will be a 2-1, whichever way direction it goes. And uh, I guess that does actually mean that Demon, if he loses here, will still have a winning map score against Pika in this tournament. He will have beaten Pika three times, and Pika will have beaten Demon twice. And it's just one of those weird things that can happen with... Uh, with map scores in a double elimination event. You can sometimes have a winning map score and still lose the series that is the elimination series. Or refinery comes up from Demon. It is going to be a relatively quick four refineries, uh, somewhat surprisingly. I would not have predicted after that last game with the position of the MCV of Pika that Demon would have gone for a fourth refinery here. I thought he would be spending that cash back at home, get himself a couple of more hammer tanks instead of zeroing out his bank account, trying to get that fourth refinery up and running. Eric's comes in for the body block. Multi-Gunner Turret is going to have to try and knock that down as the Javelin Soldiers hope that they can get their laser lock on those hammer tanks, and it will not happen. Barracks does get canceled, and it will be the reestablishment of the barracks. The hammer tanks come in. The bullfrogs looking to protect those hammer tanks, and there goes the refinery as Demon finishes up the one in the south. This one outside of his base goes down. It's a gimme that you build it. It's not a gimme that it survives. Riptide will get leached down. No, it does escape. Hammer Tank's going to try and keep themselves on full health against this multi-gunner turret. And oh my gosh, if DDF, if Pika gets this, that will be an amazing catch. No, it was almost the reverse move. Demon is like, hey, that's what I tried to do to you earlier, but you got way closer than I did to actually pulling it off. And yet... The MCV still survives. Demon is feeling like he is in a lot of trouble with how Pika is controlling this game. Javelin Soldier is going to knock down that wall. Doesn't use the Vindicators to take down the wall first, so the Javelin Soldier sort of wastes his time shooting that wall before the MCV comes in for the crush. Riptide gets a couple of shots off there, and the Riptide will be able to, I guess, do some damage to the refinery. But it will be a very, very slow kill of that refinery. Demon pushes forward. 
DDF is waiting in the upper bracket in the grand final for one of these players. And either way, I am looking forward to that best of seven. But it's feeling like Demon is trying to regain control of this game. Two more hammer tanks go down right on the front line. But he does get every single one of the javelin soldiers. And now with the reinforcements, Demon actually has a chance to, chance to take this engagement. Double guns on these hammer tanks mean that they're going to be even more cost effective as Demon gets double guns on multiple hammer tanks, keeping his hopes alive and blasting down this multi-gunner turret. He loses both refineries and he is yet to counteract that damage and do something to peak his, to Pika's economy, but he at least wins the tank fight in the middle of the map. Gets the Vindicator as well. Another win for Dimon, but it's just not the economy that he wanted. It's not the economy that he needed to hold him up in this game. Another hammer tank goes down, and this time the Vindicators do manage to escape. The engineer still looking for a job, still looking for something to do. No sell off on that multi gunner turret. Pika is spending more and more cash. He's got the bigger economy, but he's also having the less in less efficient engagements. Normally, we see these engagements be efficient for the allied player, but in this case, they're becoming more efficient for the Soviet player. But it might be too many Guardian tanks. The MCB is going to have to cancel that Crusher Crane. I know I ordered it, but I just don't have the time for the install. Meanwhile, this MCB is going to take so much damage. One Guardian tank will go down. The MCB is going to take a lot of damage as the Laser Painter wears off. The Cryo Shot is going to come in. The MCB stops, and it will be given away. The MCB goes down, and the five Guardian tanks back off. Pika is looking to close this series out. He is looking for the win, and he wants to head back into the upper bracket to meet DDF in the grand final. The Riptide sneaks into the base, and undoubtedly it has Javelin Soldiers or some other surprise for Demon. It's going to be an engineer. He's going for the cap of that War Factory, and DDF will meet Pika in the grand final. It's going to be no War Factory Demon, no Economy Demon, no MCV Demon, and Pika knocks Demon out of the lower bracket final and advances forward. Two years in a row, Demon has made it to the winner's bracket final, gets knocked down, and then unseated by someone who came through the lower bracket. Pika gets his revenge on, D on Demon and gets a shot at GDF and gets a shot at the crown. And Infinity Isle is where the last series of this tournament will kick off. We're back on the classic map, the one we have seen the most, the one the players have seen the most on the left side. Plain Soviets. No, it's not Dimon, but it looks like it. He is the winner's bracket winner. He is DDF. And getting his shot at redemption, hoping for revenge from the lower bracket. This is is Pika. Both of these players have put out some great games in the last two years. Pika, maybe a little more recently than DDF. It feels like Pika had his rise maybe in 2021, but a little bit more in 2022, really becoming a powerhouse player, someone that we expect to see. DDF, I do remember him going back and forth with Dimon in so many tournaments and so many series back in the early parts of 2020. At least that far back, DDF has been a top contender. He disappeared a little bit for, I don't know, the last year or so, much of the calendar year 2022. He was absent from a lot of competitions, a lot of replays, not seeing a whole lot from him. We'd see him every now and again. Or he was just smurfing and I didn't see him. But... Here he is, back at the Christmas tournament here in the grand final. He beat Demon. He beat Dutch Army. He beat Andre in round one of the tournament, and now he has a chance to beat Pika, a true who's who of almost every single top player who is active in the scene right now. There's a couple guys from the Chinese server that he's missing, but this is almost everyone 
who's active in the scene on the Europe side. I mean, we might be missing one or two, but obviously uh, Dutch Army and Andri sort of made earlier exits from the tournament. And DDF, he's playing random, but he has stuck it out all the way through to the end. Pika gets the kill on those conscripts. And once again, just to call attention to it, yeah, the scoreboard does read 1-0 because the upper bracket winner, so the player who has not been defeated at all in the tournament, gets that as an advantage because obviously Pika has already lost a series. And so in this particular case, that is the advantage that the upper bracket winner gets. Oil Derek going down. Terror Drone is here. One last big thank you to Rage of Heat. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's not what anyone wants. Oil Derek going down. MCV delayed. It's not the end of the world for Pika, but it's one of those things that's just so annoying, so frustrating to deal with. The Bullfrogs will tag one Vindicator. The other one just takes a bit of damage and it does oh, this, this Riptide. That, that MCV almost got infected, and of course it would be fine. It would drive back to this airfield, get healed up, and it would be totally fine. But it would just delay that expansion even more. And DDF doing everything that he can to annoy Pika to death. He thinks, if I just bother him enough in these games, he'll just leave on his own, and I'll get the championship that way. And in this case, he has gotten... Three small wins over Pika in the first couple of minutes of this game. His expansion is faster. He's killed a couple of Vindicators. He gets the catch on the Conyard like two or three times. Those micro delays disrupting everything that Pika wants to do. His timings are now slower. Everything feels a bit sloppier. And actually, there's just an Apollo waiting, but there's a MIG in the sky already. There's a MIG in the sky already. Pika doesn't even have his high ground refinery up. Okay, it's there right there. And there is a MIG in the sky waiting for him. It feels like DDF has just done everything faster. The reality is their fourth refineries were around the same time, and DDF did manage to get some disruptions to Pika, but it's not the end of the world. Pika can certainly strike back. Pika can certainly find damage against DDF in the next couple of minutes, but it will be some harvester harassment taking place here, and actually he might get the Apollo as well. The combination of the MIG and the Twin Blade is a pretty deadly one. Harvester goes down, Apollo goes down, Riptide gets paused by that Terror Drone, and now that Pika has his fourth refinery online, he actually only has three working harvesters, very soon to be two working harvesters. The harassment is tearing Pika apart. The Vindicators will escape, but not all of them, as one hits the dirt, and it will be up to this Riptide and these Dolphins to get the big, big damage done. But it's going to be so, so difficult with that adaptive armor activated with the Twin Blade overhead firing constantly and just shutting down that harassment. The lockdown of this expansion won't be very long. Uh, okay, maybe it will? I don't actually know what happened to that harvester. Did the harvester did just die with the, with the adaptive armor and everything? And, uh, well, it looks like the trade will be the dolphin and the riptide as well. Harvester comes back online. Vindicators do some nice damage to the Oil Derrick, but it's actually a Peacekeeper inside of this building getting the kill on that Oil Derrick, and the Twin Blades will dislodge him. Vindicator's going to get some nice damage on the MCV as it repositions into the middle of the map. Multi-Gunner turret getting free, free damage here against the MCV of DDF. That's the closest thing to uh, a mistake that DDF has made. Other, th other than that, it's been pretty minor. He, he takes some unnecessary damage on his MCV, but he's had wins other than that pretty much across the board in game number one. It's a strong start for the upper bracket winner. He's been playing super well in this event, and it is continuing here in the grand final. Apollos swing down to the south side of the map. Hydrofoil and Dolphins, maybe even another Riptide, going to be heading out on another harassment mission. 
to the left side of the map. Twin Blades come in, Bullfrogs and Migs are here, and the refinery will be taken this time a little bit closer to Pika's base, which means if he goes tier three, if he gets Dreadnoughts, they will be right there and in firing range of Pika's base basically immediately. Harvester doesn't activate adaptive armor until just now, and he does escape a little bit from those dolphins, trying to draw them towards where the Twin Blades actually will come in. And one Hydrofoil is not enough firepower to take down all of these Twin Blades, but he will find two Twin Blades before the damage is done. The Twin Blades do kill the Hydrofoil, but trading back for two is going to feel pretty good for the allied player. Doesn't get the Harvester which is what he really wanted. And DDF is now going to have to come in here. Vindicators come in. Hydrofoil is the response against the Twin Blades, and it's going to be up to the Riptides to try and shut down this Akula sub. The Hydrofoil, unsure of what exactly it should do. The Vindicators hoping to drop their bombs on that Akula sub, and they take a moment to find their target, but they eventually get it. And now Pika will pull back a little bit from this front line. The Riptides are going to have to trade out their lives, and they don't even get the Harvester. DDF dodges the Icy Blast from the sky and gets back to work basically immediately. Very little lost mining time for the five refinery Soviet player. And DDF seems to be spending every single dollar that he gets. His macro has been on point pretty much this whole tournament. His micro has been on point, and he gets the Riptide as they try and shut down his harassment. He says, you're getting nothing for free. You're not going to kill my Akula su uh, sub for free. You're not going to harass my Harvester for free. And indeed, one Dolphin is not going to be enough. Two Dolphins are not going to be enough. You need the Hydrofoil to jam up that Tesla Coil. It's just not going to be any simple solutions for Pika. Everything is going to have to be a multi-step process. He's throwing one dolphin at a problem, not going to work. One, two riptides at a problem, not going to work. A random cryo shot to try and freeze the harvester. DDF is paying too much attention. It's not going to be these one button solutions for DDF. He's going to need something else in the works. And even when he does it, he may lose the Vindicators as they come back across the map from their harassment. Pika has had a good run, but it's time for the final boss. DDF is looking on point. He gets his Ultra Torpedoes out in like the one moment. Oh my gosh, those perfect set of ultra torpedoes the hydrofoils were weapons jamming and he still found the one moment where the weapons jammers were off his units to get the perfect ultra torpedoes and some of those were actually some distance shots as well not something you see very often is ultra torpedoes landing from further than about an inch away the guardian tanks come out but this is way too much firepower from DDF, he gets the cash back, a fresh $500 basically in his bank account from killing off those Guardians. He is gonna trade back two Hammer Tanks. The tier two is here, but the tier three is not so close for Pika. He hasn't even started. If, it, if, it, if it's even something that he wants to get, it's not something he's going to be getting right now. Hydrofoil and Riptides will finally find a bit of damage here at the natural, at the, uh, low ground water expansion of DDF. His water expansion over here never got back online. He forgot to rebuild that harvester. That is a mistake from DDF. It does feel like he sort of can give away a couple of these mistakes. Oh man, the dodge on half of the ultra torpedo, but only half as DDF finds more kills, finds more damage. And these skill shots are coming in. Pika just gives up. Pika just leaves the game. He doesn't want to fight that one out any longer. DDF says, nope, it's not going to be easy. He gets his second point on the board, his first map win of the grand final. And game two sends us back to industrial strength providing us with some good matches. And will it be the start of the comeback for this man in the north? He's playing red. He's playing allies. This is Pika.
He is really hoping that he can start the ball rolling because he doesn't have a lot of space left in this series. Meanwhile, in the South, well, it's been almost a perfect tournament run for him. This is DDF. Yellow Soviets feeling so good. So many wins under his belt. Airfield first for Pika. But not really. He does get the barracks. He does get the engineer out. It is a little bit of a later airfield than the most technical airfield first. Ooh, that Vindicator may actually have time to get across the map. It's leaving port right now. And the engineer is going to rush for the building. He will be safe. And the Vindicator will escape. Any jukes? No. No double backs. And the engineer can, of course, just jump back in that building. Uh, second Vindicator comes in. Engineer has to exit the building and re-enter. He's just house hunting. Hopping from building to building. Occupying entire giant warehouses by himself. Oil Derek on the right side of the map has been taken. Dog in the corner. Super Reactor is up super fast for DDF. And he does manage to get that Oil Derek eventually. The one on the north side of the map. Pika gets a really good look at everything that DDF is doing. Sees inside of his base and says, All right, I know what you're up to. I know what the tricks, the tricks that you are pulling. I know what they are. And the Vindicators are going to go for the kill on those conscripts, forcing them into hiding, forcing them to spend their time indoors and not outside, enjoying the sunlight, enjoying the fresh air. Is he going to try and dog block him? <laughs> He's dog blocking the third. Uh, oh, if he sends a bunch of flak troopers over there, that would be funny because then Pika just gets free kills on flak troopers. And okay! This is actually a bit of a cryo rush. Cryocopter is crossing the map. I was not expecting a tier two follow up from Pika and suddenly this game gets kicked into high gear. We may be having ourselves a second very short game here on industrial strength. It's going to be a Vindicator taking too much damage, a dangerous amount of damage, a sneeze worth of damage to kill this Vindicator. He's gonna fly right into a flat cannon and bye bye. That Vindicator kills a Conscript on his exit, but he doesn't even kill the Conscript. He just knocks him down. He writes home and he says, Today an airplane crashed on top of me, and I got back up. And he wouldn't be lying either. Oh boy, this Cryo Rush is not accomplishing the things that Pika wanted. Huh. I will give you, that did not go how you wanted but uh, I don't know if it was quit worthy I mean obviously Pika thought that it was and that will do it for a uh, very awkward game number two and now suddenly uh, we're at match point DDF is like on the verge of victory and just out of nowhere there we go and our first match Point match will be played on Battle Base Beta in the north. He has been having a rough go of this grand finals. Plain Red, he needs your cheers. Give it up for Pika. And in the south, playing random through this whole tournament and finding great success with it. Can he keep up the wins? Can he keep up the numbers climbing in his direction? This is DDF. Plain yellow, plain empire. The random draw has given him empire more times than not. Soviet was starting to be claimed a little bit there by DDF. He got quite a few empire games in total though. Even sneaks out an allied game as well in that series versus Demon. The airfield first has not really worked. And in this case, Pika takes a little bit of a risk opening up with this many peacekeepers. But his dog did scout that it was Empire and not Soviets. So he does know, all right, holding down the middle of the map. Well, it's not the most cost effective thing in the world but it is something that is possible and it's not going to bankrupt me for nothing. I know that the Imperial Warriors will at least be trading back 
sort of on a one-to-one -one instead of the conscripts just clearing out your peacekeepers for free. Peacekeeper's going to try and press forward. Dojo is here. If DDF isn't careful, he may end up losing his entire front line. And, uh, well, this is a good thousand-something credits worth of Imperial Warriors and probably two grand worth of co uh, Peacekeepers total in the middle of the map. And we'll see which one is able to win out. Oil Derks have been grabbed on both sides. Tangu's coming out to the front line. Multigunner turret gets deployed. Pika with a very solid opening here. Wall gets added on, optimistically hoping that this third will be safe. Javelin soldiers garrison up the structure as well, meaning any Tangu's when they fly over that section will be taking a little bit of extra damage as those jabs get their shots off. Imperial Warriors, they're going to press right down the front door. They're going to walk in the open gate and say, Hi, hello, hey, how are you? It's me. Also, we have a lot of guns. Also, we brought a dojo. <laughs> Someone shows up to your house and they're like, Hi, I also brought a house. I have an entire building with me. It's packed along in this suitcase. And now Pika, who is getting his third base, gets his war factory as well. He's going to have a moment to wait, but he is going to lose his oil, Derek. Always an annoying move as that engineer waves to his new digs. Riptide does come on out. And, uh, well, suddenly it feels like, oh, actually, an Apollo and a couple of Vindicators would be very useful in this moment. As I say that the airfield first hasn't worked out for Pika in this series. It suddenly feels like, oh, actually, airfield would be super useful in this moment. But it's going to be the crush of the MCV that's going to have to save Pika and buy him time. He's not in a bad spot with that third refinery coming online. His dog scouting that there's no water expansion from DDF. But, whoa! GDF sold his mecha bay. That's a critical misclick. Or just some kind of crazy, bizarre play where you sell your war factory and you decide the barracks is the only thing your grandfather needed, so that's the only thing you're going to need. And suddenly, the Riptides do get overwhelmed. And the fight begins, and that might be the saddest grand finals we have ever had in a tournament. That was very strange. Uh, Pika versus DDF, I feel like I'm missing a part of the story. Maybe the lag was insane in these games and the latency was a um, hundred million seconds, but uh, it was going to be a tough fight, but Pika just gives up right there at the end. I guess you can't really give up in the beginning. And DDF takes a perfect 4-0 in like 15 minutes, so... We saw some great games today. The Grand Finals were not really them. I hope you enjoyed it. Maybe not the Grand Finals, I understand. And that is the Christmas Tournament Wrapped. DDF with an amazing performance all throughout the tournament. And unfortunately, Pika showing great games early on and not so much as the tournament went further. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And this is Cyber signing out. The anti-spoiler is going to be a big old chunk.